Okay, welcome everyone and welcome CCTV. Thank you for coming to our wonderful event here under the great uh, pine tree. This is, um, this is a meeting uh, sponsored by the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and Including Freedom. And uh, it was in a way uh, caused by Jill G Clark Golub, who is a member of Women's International League also, because she introduced me to her friends who are going to be the speakers tonight. And uh, we went up to visit them and we wanted to welcome them here to Burlington, the Black Alliance for Peace and Uhuru Freedom. So uh, the person who is going to uh, introduce the speakers is Yane. Yane, what is your last name? There you go. Yeah. Okay. So you can take over now. Greetings, everyone. Um, so cool to be here with you all. Um, Oh, okay. Let me know, like, anytime if you think you can't hear me, just kind of do like a little, this doesn't amplify, it's for the video. But um, if you feel like you can, ha can't hear me, then, um, or you can't hear us, then you can indicate with like, you know, like a thumbs up to say, can you speak a little louder? Um, and um, so how is it right now? Is it okay? How do we say it's okay? Seems like thumbs up will be it's okay, right? <laughs> um, so maybe thumbs down, the sound is not loud enough. Can you speak a little higher? So how is it right now? Um, so some people are saying it's needs, it needs to be a little louder. Is it possible that if you can't hear us good, that you could move a little closer? Um, we move closer. Um, if it's not um, uncomfortable for you, or um, I think it is, it'd be great to be closer anyway, you know. So um, once we get settled, and I know everybody can hear. Um, is this better? Yeah, all right, so um, my name is Yane Indigo and I'm from Philadelphia and um, I have been kind of living in Vermont kind of for a, almost two years. Um, my primary organizing um, home is Philadelphia um, and um, I organize closely with both of the people that I'm here um, with, um, Pam and Russell, um, and, um, and we work on a lot of projects together, and we're going to be talking, so, you know, all of that will come out in the conversation, I think, um, so I'm not going to do, like, a whole big introduction. I am also an artist. Um, I have a single out right now. It's called Philly Work. It's a Philly rally song and um and i um, am a writer as well um so i'm i'm happy to be here with these two beloved people um who are just so amazing and i'm excited for you all to have the opportunity to um, engage in their amazingness um, and for them to have the opportunity to connect with all of you and your amazingness. I'm sure that you all are also in your own ways amazing, but I don't know yours, so I'm excited and we are to get to know that, but I do know what is right here next to me. And so very, very um, happy to be bringing them here for you to um, have a, a moment with um, very important people in our history and our struggle and our fight for liberation um, and to be able to learn from them and um, 
you know, experience the generosity of their spirits. And um, so this is, especially at a time like this, when there's so much to fight for, and we know that that's what this is about, but also like what we're fighting for, the connection that we need to be embodying that we have with each other, um, which is the winning force, ultimately, you know, um, it's what fights, what's what guides us to fight, right? So we have to really also be like sitting into that connection. So um, I'm going to um, invite, um, I'm going to try to think like, Order. I think that um, I'm going to invite Russell first to introduce yourself, um, and um, and then um, Mama Pam um, to just say what it is that you want people to know um, about um, you, about who you are. I will just say a little something, just because some things he just shouldn't have to say and saying for Mama Pam, but. Um, Russell is um, uh, Russell Schultz III, and he's the namesake um, and um, son of um, Russell Maroon Schultz. Um, and so um, Maroon is a freedom fighter who was incarcerated, captured by the state um, after his, um, his um, intentional acts uh, around liberation, you know, like we, so many of us are intentionally doing work, you know, to resist oppression, not only just for ourselves, but for other people. And that is what he did and, you know, and was incarcerated for 50 years. Um, he was a member of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army. And um, he spent 25 years in solitary confinement. Um, and um, part of that is because he, escaped from prison multiple times, lived on the land, that's how he got the nickname Maroon. Um, and Maroon also was um, a father, as um, demonstrated by Russell sitting here, and also um, a teacher. And, um, and so he was also very intent in making sure that his um, knowledge and he was if you read his writings and you engage him you know that he's very wise that it was passed on and he passed it on you know to a son who has his own brilliance you know to read and so how he received that and also to so many other students and so you know that will be some of what you get to get access to in this moment both the wisdom of the father and of the son um, and um, so um, I'll after I Pat, I'll tell you a little bit about Pam and then I'll let them introduce themselves and then we'll just, you know, talk a little bit. Um, so, um, Mama Pam is um, my mama in the movement and um, I say that um, because we are very close but, you know, the reason that I'm so close to her and so lucky and so blessed, you know, in that closeness is because of the amazing, wonderful um, person that she is just like the expanse of kindness that is in her heart but like the depth of passion and the fierce love for the people like that is something we all share you know and then the, when you watch the different ways that people embody that love and in, in the very little moments of choices you know always choosing you know that which is most principled always choosing the righteous path, you know, um, and always choosing advocacy, you know, and so also just very special and, um, you know, so Mama Pam is a member of MOVE and um, MOVE is a um, revolutionary group out of Philadelphia um, also that stood up for life, stood up against the um, against the harming of all life, the air, the land, animals, you know, they, they protested against zoos, just like, you know, they put animals in zoos, they put um, people in zoos, um, protested against, you know, pet shops and, you know, just like the pollution and, you know, and also the, the lack of respect for human life um, and it was not tolerated. And so there were altercations that were, um, happened between MOVE and the state. Um, and, you know, just the act of 
liber acting liberated was too much resistance um, for the state. And so um, many people know that in 1985, and some of you may not know, but in 1985, um, May 13th, um, the city of Philadelphia dropped a bomb on um, MOVE headquarters with people in it that they knew were in it um, and um, murdered and maimed, murdered um, 11 people, um, two people survived, um, and one of those people who survived was ch a child, but five of the children were also murdered. Um, and, um, and then there were many members of MOVE who were incarcerated, already had been incarcerated. Um, and there's so much more to MOVE. And, you know, so that's like a very significant moment in our history that um, is not really equal to much. You know, I don't know what would be equal to the, the significance of that. And MOVE is even so much more than that. And, you know, and that needs to be understood. And also the organ, like the, the people, and particularly Mama Pam. And so, you know, being able to um, also gain and hear um, from her is something I'm excited to have helped facilitate. Um, and so I'm going to. Um, give the mic now to Russell to be able to um, say a little bit more and give you a little bit of a sense of him and then you know you can pass it on to to mama um, hello thank you thank you Yane thank you Yane. Um, uh, thank you all for uh, being here and um, coming out um, Again, I'm Russell Shooks III. Uh, my father is Russell Maroon Shooks, um, who was a Black Panther, um, a Black Liberation Army general, um, and a freedom fighter for um, global communities, um, not just his community in West Philadelphia. But um, my father, you know, was known in Africa, and he was known in South America, and he was known in Cuba, you know, and he was known in places globally for, um, for his staunch ideologies around liberation um, and for being a, uh, a, 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 a theoretician, but more than uh, a theoretician and more than uh, an academic, because he wrote books and things like that. But my father was also a person of action. So he didn't like to just talk it. He wanted to actually show you by modeling what he thought should be done. You know, he didn't like to say, oh, we should do this and we should do that. He would just do it and then people would be like, oh, well, I have to take, you know, knowledge of that which has happened and decide whether or not I'm going that way or not, or whether that was a positive move for liberation or whether that was an idiotic move for liberation. And a lot of people saw his liberating himself from prisons as kind of, well, I don't know, you know, because a part of his party line or his ideology was that if you thought that you were falsely incarcerated, because as we know, a lot of people who are in jail are like, I got a bad case or I got a bad rap or they did me wrong or what, and a lot of it is, it is that way. Um, some it isn't. Some you actually, you actually did the crime. Not that you that the system is right or whatever, but there are tons of people who did not do the crime and they're incarcerated. And my father would encourage those people to liberate themselves. He would say, if you didn't do it, if you're saying that you didn't do it and they unjustly locked you up, why are you not trying to leave? <laughs> forget the judge, forget the system and all that. That may have helped you get to where you are. But if you have the opportunity and the breath within you to try to leave the people who have unjustly incarcerated you, why aren't you doing it? With life and death and everything, and because that's a part of it, obviously, that, well, if I leave, they might kill me. Well, yeah, 
Well, it doesn't kill you that you're here unjustly. It doesn't kill you that you're in a cell with the worst conditions, but you're innocent. You haven't done anything to belong in this cell under these harsh conditions. Um, Another ideology of my dad's is we're here and all of you people say that you're innocent, right? But it's 50, 11 of us or it's 100 of us and it's two guards watching us. And 70 of you say you're innocent. So it's 70 to 2. The other 30 of y'all say whatever. But it's 70 of us that say we're innocent and two guards watching us. And we can't figure anything to liberate ourselves. So those type of, you know, ideas and ideologies are base level for my father. But he also um, had uh, solitary confinement courses because my dad spent 25 years in solitary confinement. So if you came to solitary confinement, um, then you generally had to study under my father. It wasn't like a a question or issue and whether you wanted to or not. If you came to that hole and it would be him and his comrades and then it would be uh, also uh, the white militia, you know, or the Klan in prison or uh, just the white ultra right and that exists in prison. And the prison administration pits people against so in the hole, you got these guys, and in the hole, you got those guys. And then we just open the cells and let whatever happens, happens. So if you're a new young guy and you're coming to the hole, they say you don't get any choices. It's a war happening in the hole. They're going to open the gates, and you're going to be standing there looking which way to go. We're going to tell you which way to go, and we're not going to ask you for your opinion on life or death. We're going to save you. And you have to study this. You're going to have to read Shaking at the Diop. You're going to have to read uh, uh, John Henry Clark. You're going to have to read uh, Yusuf Ben Joe Hawkin. You're going to have to read whoever it is they deem that you have to read and study it and know it back and forth. And they're going to test you on it. It's not going to be just read this book and no, it's going to be a test tomorrow. So when you don't pass the test and the door's open, you know what's going to happen. So this is the type of lifestyle that exists. A lot of times we talk about prison work and we talk about, you know, helping people in prison. There's a culture in prison that is untold. There's a culture in prison. We fight for freedom fighters. We fight for people in prison. But there is a culture in prison that, like I said, is untold. You know, and one of my favorite um Freedom Fighters, Political Prisoners, is, is, is King and Albert Wood Fox from the Angola Three because they were in prison in Louisiana, and Louis, Louisiana has a, a male sex trade industry, a black market for sex trade. As soon as you step one foot into the prison, either you're being sold or you're selling or you've managed to make sure you're not sold or you're selling. But either you're one or the other. And uh, to their credit, um, the Angola Three as Panthers in Louisiana, Panthers who became Panthers in prison, they weren't Panthers before they went to prison. They became Panthers in prison and um, formed an anti-rape unit in prison, which is not the culture of prison. The culture of prison is to let whoever get raped get raped. They should have had a shank. They should have got buffed up. They should have done whatever they should have did. They didn't do it, and they got raped. Dango the three said, no, no, no. These are young guys coming in here, some of them juvenile lifers. Some of them, you know, some of these people don't even, this lifestyle. So we're going to, again, it's going to be war down to the teeth. It's going to be war, and we're going to kill anybody who tries to do that. If you're doing that and we catch you, it's me and you, and we're going to kill you, or you're going to kill us, one or the other. But it's death to that and that is the type of culture and the type of people who I've been fortunate enough and privileged enough through my father through the struggle through the lifestyle of freedom fighter to be able to 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 have the 
uh, opportunity to sit at their feet and including Pam and the teachings of John Africa, which I will not go into because that's for Pam to go into, but to, to experience the teachings of John Africa, to grow up in Philadelphia, to watch them drop a bomb on babies and women and to understand and to see it 20, 30 years later pan out, to see a whole bunch of people be really cute and sexy and cool about eating raw food, about having babies at home, about being nude, about dreading up, about dreading up, you know, and returning food to the earth and calling earth mama and all of that. Back in 85 and all that, when I was a kid and all that, none of that was cool. And you was dirty because your hair was like this and all of that. And you care about animals and you had your baby at home. Oh, you, you nasty. You're dirty and you're nasty. What's the culture? It wasn't, a, it wasn't a gang of people. There wasn't people with dreadlocks. People didn't have dreadlocks. If you had dreadlocks, you were dirty and nasty. And your hair was dirty. And there was no way you were cleaning that. Or Jamaican. Or anyone on the globe who had, or from India. If you're from India and you got dressed and you're a shaman or whatever it is, you're still dirty. We don't care where you at on the globe. You're dirty. There's no way you could clean your hair. You're dirty. And that's a, that was a culture. That was a concept. That was a standard. You know, and so I grew up with that, and I love that. I love that I grew up with all of that. I love that I faced all of those challenges. I love that I'm still facing those challenges. I love that I knew freedom fighters who died and gave their life for things like that, that people at one point uh, uh, belittled, and, that, and then you can see them 20 years later acting like, look, look, look. Oh, my baby, I had her at home, look. Uh, I'm in the pool, uh, I'm in the water. I uh, look, you know, and it's like, it's like, yeah, people got killed for that. And people got killed for that. You flying around, it's all cute. Oh, you're an birth home mom and all that's all cute. No. Move tried to do that. They was killing babies. They was stomping. You have a baby in your belly? You they dump your belly. Cause you got this and you got that and you eat raw food and you trying to be healthy and cool. No, that get a stomp on the head and kill your baby for that. You wanna do that? We're gonna kill your baby for that. And so that is the culture that, and I say that also to say that these things are cyclical and we're coming at a point in time where the state is going to ramp it up on you and me. They already ramped it up on me and my family, but they're going to ramp it up on you. Like they ramping it up over there in Palestine. They're going to ramp it up because murder and killing and all of that ain't nothing. It's nothing. So get used to it. Get prepared for it, because it's coming to you. You think you're here safe and all of this and all that's cool? Yeah, you cool for a minute. You cool for a minute. Don't think that stuff could happen globally over there and it's not gonna affect you over here. So keep chilling and not standing up and not doing what it needs to be done in order to hold the, the foot of this beast over here. They got the foot of the beast over there. They got him like this. And we over here like this. They're gonna, he dragging him like this. He dragging him, he dragging him, he dragging. they got his leg. They got him, they got him, he dragging. We need to get that leg. We need to get that leg. Whoever's left on the planet, you need to get that leg. Cause they can't, they can't do it all over the world. They can't oppress globally unless we allow it. Unless we, unless we're content with it globally. I'll pass. One thing I just want to, it's so funny, like, putting this up and it doesn't do anything, but. <laughs> You're used to it. The I know, I know. And I'm like, technique, you know. <laughs> um, but when you were talking about, if you think you're safe over here, it made me think about that book, A Long Way Gone. So there's a book, A Long Way Gone, that's written by a man who was a ch soldier, a child soldier in Sierra Leone. And it's very heartbreaking. Um, and I was listening, I read the whole book, I don't even know how I did it. I was listening to the book recently, it got to a point and I just haven't been able to go for it because I just can't stand what I know happens next. Um, um, but w one of the things that they talked about is how they heard about the war, but they just, it was all the way over there. They never imagined, all the way up until 
earlier that same day, they ran off to the store, and next thing they know, their village was gone and never were to return again. And, you know, and all of the tragedies that happened that led to them becoming murderers as themselves, you know, as children. Um, so it's really that real, and it's always easy to imagine that it's on somewhere else when you are separated from our connection. So I just wanted to mention that, but I want to definitely, you know, give this microphone over to our beloved Mama Pam, um, your treat. On a move in love, not fear. Can you hear me? Okay, a little bit higher. Okay, all right. The reason why I'm really being careful and I might wind up standing up and getting in the center so that you can hear, it wasn't too long ago I had throat cancer. And this is really about the second, you know, place, you know, that I spoke at publicly. And uh, um, so I'm very emotional when I speak. I might as well get on up now. Yeah. Oh, okay. I better sit on down now. <laughs> in a minute. Nope, nope, nope. I'm, I am going to get up in a minute. And, uh, People can still continue to move closer. Right. She doesn't need to strain her voice. Right. So my name is Pam Africa, and on I'm known as Mama Pam. My involvement, I'm going to talk, talk about the movement and how I wound up being in the movement, which is an example, you know, for other people. Um, and, and also, I want to let you know that I am also the chairperson of the International Concerned Family and Friends of Mumia Abu Jamal, who did a lot of work up here, and uh, because Burlington is part of the reason why Mumia is alive today. Burlington and a lot of other places in Vermont in the 80s and 90s, you know, were getting involved. And I got pictures of, you know, the demonstrators and all uh, hanging um, um, near a bell tower or something, a free Mumia sign, and you know, um, the puppets, you know, um, right, right. And I'm talking about the organizing that's just, you know, international and very youthful. Um, when I got involved with MOVE, it was on May 20th, 1977. I want to say before then, which was Malcolm's birthday, which was May 19th, I didn't give a damn about move or them nappy head. We used to call them the mop heads on the corner. And all because I've been miseducated all my life. And all things that are good for you and can open here and can feed here, they moved away from you, you know? And I'm a clear victim of that because I could not stand move. I thought when I'm watching them that they were dirty, they didn't work, and I'm watching them every day. This is because the media was saying that. And, uh, and then you had other people mouthing, like myself, and uh, what the media <laughs> was saying about the people that was on the corner, I'm seeing them work. I'm seeing them with their children. And you know, and I'm saying, there was mother, I have to say it how I was thinking it then, those motherfuckers don't give a damn about shit. I'm hearing that, what the hell, they, they demonstrating their puppy pals. This is a place where they have, you know, dogs, little puppies, they got birds, they got all kinds of life locked up in cages and they're selling them to people. Some people who don't give a darn really about what it is that they're doing about life and uh, um, people would buy fish, all kind of beautiful fish, and then forget to feed it. And they don't see this as a form of captivity. And, uh, you know, it's a form of, you know, um, jailing and uh, snatching people. And I remember when I, um, you know, one of the things that people were saying, you know, um, I believe, and, uh, you know, and what happened to people who were snatched from their homelands, mostly Africans and brought over here. What about the fish that belongs in the ocean? We gotta wait for you to feed them. 
don't have to, you know, they feed themselves the connection to the water, what we, what we all have to um, have and all clean and pure. We never had the closest thing. Oh my God, when I drink some water up here from his house, you know, the well, I mean, it's it's not like you drinking that bottle of water because it's still, I don't give a darn how much you pay for it. It's not right. And all you know, it's been taken apart and put somewhere else. And uh, but getting back to this thing with, you know, move demonstrating against, you know, the zoo. And when the circus came to town, when the elephant was walking, you know, everybody out there clapping, me too. I got my kids, the circus is coming to town. And I didn't know what I was looking at. I was actually looking again at something in captivity, something like until I saw the beating of, what's the brother said, can't we all get along? Rodney, Rodney King. And you know, this was a man who went around the world how the cops just beat him and beat him and beat him. And they had these electrical prongs and they was, you know, doing this to him. And I'm like, you know, remember how horrible that is. And it is. But the only reason why the animals that they be walking down the street in the, and be in circuses is because of the electrical wand. You know, do you think that you can just normally stick your head under the elephant and he keep that damn foot up like this here while you play games? And you know, his natural instinct is to, you know, number one, you're not going to get it under there. But, you know, they've been tortured to the fact that they can tap him, lift that foot up. The lion jumping through a ring of fire. The same thing that they have, you know, happening to us. You know, John Africa taught us to love and revere life and with the understanding that we ain't gonna never be free until all God's living beings be free. And our uh, and we were taught to look at the um the problems that Okay, I remember one time I was uh, I was still smoking cigarettes, and then I'm talking about the person that was on drugs on the street, and all uh, you know, and I'm saying, Dad, you know, dude, you know better, and all uh, you know, that stuff is killing them, blab, 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 and I'm going on and on and on, and the coordinator said, What about the junkie in your ass? Excuse me. Right. <coughs> Don't you smoke cigarettes? Do that not kill you? Don't you know that drinking pure water is better than drinking this? You got to fight for the things that you need. But instead, we know we endorsing it because we see in separations and you know, we don't see everything as one thing. This monster is coming out after every living being. And, uh, the massacre that they did to my family was horrific. Dropping the bomb, killing 11 men, women, and children. And, uh, and nobody, everybody talked about that. But there was dogs in there. There was cats in them houses. There was birds. There was people, pets. And uh, the trees was destroyed around there. But the only thing that people can talk about was the 11 men, women, and children that was burnt to, um, to death, shot to death, and are trying to escape that fire, that's all people can talk about because we taught to see, you know, in separations. And uh, how many people here own a dog? Cats, birds, and I'm saying, you love these things. And, uh, you know, people was weeping over that and people was like, you know, like shoving their cares and, you know, things like that away. And uh, so I'm saying, you know, revolution is not just thumping and bumping with these guards, thumping and bumping with these cops when they attack you. And, uh, you know, when we educate people, we got to take it all the way across the board. You know, with the understanding that the only way that we're going to get out of this alive is that we care for each other and care for other forms of life. Do you remember, I don't know about up here, but in Philadelphia, um, the bees, there was no bees around because they were constantly, you know, poisoned and poisoned and poisoned. And then all of a sudden, the mad men of science, real, you know, hit what indigenous people was trying to tell them, what Africans was trying to tell them, and other people that is tuned into life. The importance of that bee.
you know, then they start heavy populating. Everybody had a bee house in the city now, <laughs> you know, because they understand the importance of that. You know, and as simple a thing as that is, it also makes you understand that we all need each other. We're all connected. Our food is connected to the roots, to that tree and to the roots that feed it. And uh, this government is trying to kill every form of life. You go into Philadelphia, and uh, um, <coughs> you know what? Well, in in the city as well, well, you know what they do is they there's, there's something to the trees so that they can't mate. And uh, and what we wind up with a whole lot of allergies. I mean the seeds. Well, they kind of way you germinate, you know, whatever. You know, so you wind up with all this stuff on the ground, and you know, you wind up with trees that's not producing other than what it is that they want. How many people know what a sweet potato really look like? You know, you know how it had the hair and stuff on. You remember back in our day, and you, know, you know when the peach had fuzz on it. And, uh, you know, when watermelons had seeds, I don't eat a watermelon unless I see that black seed. If that watermelon ain't red, black, and green, I don't want it. And uh, the seed of life, the seed of life in the cucumber, the seed of life in the lemon, you know, the seeds of life. I'm saying this thing ain't got no problem. It poisons the water that we all got to drink. What kind of thing is this? And uh, because when you poison our water, it poisons theirs. And it's pure and as good as this water here, it still isn't as good as it was yesterday and we got a fight or you gonna wind up with water like us in the city <laughs> for real for real <laughs> this is part of the reason why this government uh, dropped the bomb you know on move and all uh, you know and I remember thinking in the May 19th Malcolm's birthday and um, 77 and all uh, you know <laughs> These people's tripping on this corner they talking about our government got time to be messing around with these fools you know, this is how I was seeing them. This was a revolutionary organization that was fighting for each and every last one of their lives. And I'm saying, me, myself, I'm going along with what Rizzo was one of the worst hit the spitting son of a gun that ever walked the face of this earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was miseducated by my parents. And uh, you know who... Everybody familiar with Rizzo? You familiar with Hitler? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, give him a quick Rizzo, a quick a, bio, a quick one. Um, Rizzo claimed the fame was um, that he's get tough on you know cops, and if they say break their heads, I will. His whole thing was to beat people, you know, causing the problems in the community, and or uh, you know putting you know the drugs came in through this administration and of the cops, the lawyers, the judges, the people that's, the underlings that's on the street that's being locked up and also they can make more money. And uh, you know, um, Rizzo, and uh, his job was to do the illusion of solving the crime when you know, um, the biggest drug dealers in our communities is Walgreens, Eckert, Right aid, I mean, they call them drug stores. And they will drug children up yeah. from the womb on up. They have our parents, and uh, I have friends that was um, got addicted to what's that painkiller? Um, Opioid. Uh, Oxycodone. Oxycodone, yeah. And uh, I mean, wind up addicted to this stuff. And when people become addicted to this stuff, and all uh, you know, People don't have the understanding of who they are, mm -hmm. you know, because some people's personality change. Everybody don't have the money to keep it going. Like children was who was taken Ritalin, and all uh, you know, uh, you know, from this government. And uh, there was a, a study, and it was put in city council, and it was by a councilwoman, Janie Blackwell, and uh, her and a journalist from a newspaper called the New Observer. They put on the city council floor that the drug riddling that they were giving to our children you know it causes long-term effects you know if this stuff is so bad they like to put black people poor people on the front line of the fires and all you know so they can be killed first and most you know they would not be eligible for the service what is this that they gave this ain't my words 
I got the articles. They put it in the paper. They had things in the community and city council. To this day, you can still get rid of It was pointing out that the biggest drug that was being sold in the city of Philadelphia, like in, um, I was underground from 85. 89. First time I had seen Ritalin, I was on an underground area, something like this. And, uh, but this Ritalin was the biggest seller in the black community in the drugstores. Mothers was lined up for Ritalin. And here's another thing. And uh, if you got your child on Ritalin, you can get a up in your yeah, check. You get a welfare increase. A welfare increase. Mm -hmm. And uh, these sisters, these brave sisters in this particular case, <laughs> you know, um, you know, put stood up there and put it out. The next thing you know, the elected official, they got a front page article going down on these women. Right. And or you know, and they're not revolutionary women like us. But I'm saying they learn in different things. Just like I don't know how many people here demonstrates, and mostly probably all y'all demonstrate um, against the war in Palestine. And uh, people are finding out, like you know, people well, why did they attack you? And you say, you know, why did they attack the students who was just peacefully saying and telling the truth to stop the murder, stop the genocide? That's what his father was saying. This is what Move was saying. And, but not only about that one particular issue, which goes back way, way back with all of us, the fight for Palestine. You see Dr. Martin Luther King, you see Malcolm X, you see Kwame Ture, you see him way back then in the early 60s talking about the murders and stuff that was going on there, the taking of the land that was going on there. And it was people who were speaking up, but we got this media who comes in between us and these people that are paid in order to actually make separations, you know, um, and so, oh, well, that's not important because we're, we're dealing with putting the school building up over here and, uh, you know, and that's whole miseducation, diversions away from the actual battle. And uh, that's why this government came to our home in 1978 with the pretense, May 20th of 77. They were coming with the pretense that, um, Move was a problem, and Move knew that, and you know, because they had already killed in 1976 Janine's baby, in 1975 they killed Rhonda's baby, and um, uh, Lucene's baby. They had beaten down men so daggone bad, and you know, that their limbs was broke, and all uh, you know. And a, a elder across the street said he witnessed a beating the night that Janine's baby was killed. Uh, one of the move members, and on um, this was a guy in the wheelchair who can't go nowhere, who knew and loved move for who they are, you know, because he watched them hit the, from his window. That's all he can see, you know. Uh, he said they was beating Jerry so bad. He said he saw Jerry pass out. He said the cop kicked him and his eyes popped just like that, you know. Uh, I seen that beating, you know, many times. I witnessed that beating. And, uh, you know, and I can only relate it back to move. And then why was these things happening? They demonstrated, like I said, at the zoo to make people understand that when you go into that zoo and you're looking for entertainment, you better understand what it is that you're seeing. You're seeing men, women, children, and are, uh, you know, snatched and robbed from Africa, from every place from around the world to be put into a cage. You know, who think that the elephant is happy in a little area, maybe not as big as this? When he had, you know, supposed to roam and, you know, you want to go here and you want to go there, and this elephant is there. The lions, the same thing. The birds in the cages, the locking up of life and what John Africa to a move that if you can, you got to be concerned about all life. If it's unfair for political prisoners, if it's unfair and unjust for everyone that's in these prisons, everyone that you know is forced to do things that they wouldn't do and you know, because of the terror, the terror of this government, and you know, we was taught to see these things. 
and, and, and be able to explain to people and get people activated. And they didn't, they move, although MOVE is a predominantly black organization, and uh, they came at MOVE with everything that they had. In 1978, look, because it, it's, it's a whole lot of story here. Um, uh, go to YouTube and see every move uh, film there. And, uh, and I also do the work on Mumia Abu-Jamal, which was given to me by John Africa. And that I'm Pam Africa um, of International Concerned Family and Friends of Mumia Abu-Jamal. In 1981, when Mumia was viciously beaten, shot, and uh, um, um, framed, um, you know, I can go on. You, you, do I, uh, well, me. I mean, if you want to finish telling that story, and then right. maybe we can just see if there are people who have some questions, um, right. and you know, go from there. Right. See, don't give me a mic now. <laughs> and, uh, I got some stories that's bottled up in here that I haven't been able to tell for a long time, and they just coming out in no particular order because I didn't intend to go there. I tend to go, you know, somewhere else. But this is revolution. Right. This is revolution. You know, you got to do it all. You got to do a 360. We got plenty of time because we're going to be coming back and forth. And all, uh, but you know what happened with Russell's father and all. Uh, um, Mumia Abu Jamal was on death row. Um, look up his case. It's, it's so many, you know, things, you know, in dealing with his case. And all, uh, but you had the evidence that Mumia is innocent without a doubt. And this government, just like Trump try to pretend like, you know, he, um, no, he ain't, he ain't pretending because he acting like he's, um, you know, a uh, boss. He ain't in jail yet. So I'm telling people, don't even rally. And, uh, you know, it's glad we got as far as we did, but he ain't in jail yet. Um, but um, also, um, I'm, I want to let you know that I am um, a mother, a grandmother, a great grandmother. A uh, great great grandmother, and uh, and um, I'm a frontline soldier, and I got CRS. You know what that is? <laughs> can't remember shit. <laughs> and sometimes I say can't remember. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, it depends upon what crowd we're dealing with. So I'm saying we everyday people here, so you know I can say things the way I'm saying it. And uh, but um, this brother. This government want us to hold hands with them while they murder somebody that is completely innocent. People will say, how is Mumia doing? Mumia's not doing good. And you know, he's not doing good. The longer he stay in there, the closer he is to death. And you know, they have done every illegal thing. I mean, blatantly illegal. Just like the stuff which are just blatantly illegal. You know, Mumia is alive today not because this government wanted to do the right thing. He's not off a of death row because um, this government said, oh, you know, I think we need to take him off of, you know, death row. He don't deserve to be there. Um, and I, we'll go about the other thing. But that came from people pressure. It came from having meetings like we're having today, getting together, loving, unifying, understanding what's going on. And if you don't understand, the seed was planted to make you want to know more. And once you hear the truth, you feel it. Right. And you'll act. Right. And uh, you know, whether you just, you know, your thing is, well, let me call Susie and tell her what to do. Susie might be a hell of an activist and she want to take it here, there, there, and the other. And uh, you know, what I'm saying, the information that you get here tonight and uh, about this government and what it's doing to all of us and uh, you know, about the unity and love that we have to have for Every being, every being has a purpose. Every being have a purpose. And um, the fact that, you know, in this movement, you'll have people that'll come, that'll go, different circumstances causes people to step back for a minute. But usually when people step back, they talk about what they saw or what they heard. And, uh, and then some years later, you know, you might see the person come back and uh, because we study doing the work of uh, what We've been doing since the beginning of time, bringing people in and showing them, look at this. Right now, we all living in some very, very dangerous times. A lot of people take that word A1, AI for granted. And I'll take the fact that, you know, in Philadelphia, uh, at the University of Penn, they have um, robot dogs. 
Mm -hmm. that you, you seen that? You know, and that's not just for there. You know, it's for us, the people that are rising up. You seen how they come at the people when the demonstrations, the fool that brought all the cops and walked over there and stood beside in front of the church with the Bible upside down. You know, you, you're only looking at the one. There's millions of that thing. There's millions of that thing who have them same feelings and they're educating people to see people who are calling and standing for that which is right as the enemy. That's right. The peacekeepers are, you know, not looked up as, you know, the people in Palestine is not looked upon as the people who are being wronged, who are being murdered. And uh, they're looking at this is how they took this land from the indigenous people. I remember I used to cheer for the cowboy and hope the hell they kill every last one of them red skinned Indians because they mess with our people. Hey. Right, the propaganda, the misinformation. Yes. The, yeah, and um, thank you, Pam. Yeah. Um, and. And, you know, um, one of the things that we talked about was the introduction to the Black Alliance for Peace. And um, the Black Alliance for Peace has a primary campaign, which is, you know, stop the war against African people in the U.S. and abroad. And a part of, you know, this, connect this connection is that, um, you know, we have these wars, you know, that are happening in these other locations, you know, like in Palestine, in Congo, in Sudan, etc. And, um, and we don't recognize that there's a war that's happening here in the U.S. as well. It's becoming more and more apparent, but that is what people have been attempting to um, bring to the, um, to bring to the consciousness of people, um, you know, for many, like actually for generations, like there's never not been a war. Um, and just like what's happening in occupied Palestine, where um, there's an ongoing um, effort to relieve people of the occupation, people who are being occupied, vision, get, go night night, night night, night night. Just like there's that effort here, people here, you have, you have colonized people here and people who, are, who have been taken from their homelands, who have been consistently um, guided, directed, and unfree. Like if you're not even allowed to think for yourself, if you're not even given the in room to dream, imagine, and think for yourself, how on earth can you possibly be free? You know, and what you're thinking, and this is what Mama Pam is demonstrating, what you're thinking is guiding what you're doing, how you're receiving information, how you're interacting with information. And the, the whole goal is to have you act on behalf and you know, to the benefit of others and against the benefit of yourself. And, you know, and that is the way that we are engaging or being engaged in a war at all times, even when you're not dealing with all of the physical realities, which include like being like having communities that have unhoused people. That's an act of violence that we all have to endure. We all have been enduring, whether you are in a home or you have to you have to lose a bit of your humanity by walking by a person who is unhoused and acting like it's okay and just going about your business and then doing that over and over and over and over and over again. That is not being human. And we are doing that all the time. And so these acts, these are acts of war against our humanity that are always the beginning. That's proceeds. It gets first is the person who's unhoused on the ground, then it's this neighbor, and it all, it builds up and builds up until it just gets to you and you're that person that you were walking by, right? And, 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 and maybe it's, you're that person because you're bombs, because there are bombs now being dropped in your neighborhood, you know, like in West Philadelphia in 1985 on May 13th, a thing that you don't think will ever happen, but happen to people who you're, happen to, like, you know, people that you're looking at. Um, so, um, we invited you all to come here, um, to be able to be 
exposed to individuals, like part of the importance of revolution is learning. And this is learning from what people know and what have experienced and what they have done um, and not reinventing the wheel so that we just that whole, we passed the baton. Like somebody's got to like cross the finish line. So we can't just have this pass the baton idea forever around the same fight. Like there's got to be like we finished and then we're making progress to like building the new world and expanding the new world as opposed to just fighting the ongoing oppression and letting it continue to transform and mutate and imprison and incarcerate our children and so building connections and knowing who we have and like you know um, and and being able to um, be more effective and informed in how you seek to address the um, the need to rebel and revolt against evil you know um, and being able to not make unnecessary mistakes um, being able to um, to um, immature yourself ideologically, you know, that's the really important thing so that you actually, you're not acting and acting really hard with the kind of information like Mama Pam was talking about that she had when she was younger. If she's trying to be a revolutionary with the, I, without that knowledge that she gained from John Africa, she could be doing all the wrong things and working against herself. So that knowledge and access and getting yourself on a page and understanding why you're doing things, understanding the, 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 the way to be principled, the ways to organize, what things not to do, how, what things to let go of, you know, all of those things are the things that you do through experience, and some of it you don't have to experience fresh. You can experience it through through experienced organizers. And so this is like an introduction to, um, to people who are actually in your ecosystem as we are doing this work to build um, a movement that crosses the finish line. And so beyond you know, whatever is said while we're up here, there's the value of beginning to be, con of being connected or deepening connections. If people are organizing in bodies, then, you know, being able to connect that organizing work, if not being able to get connected to organizing work and having access to the, um, the revolutionary treasures of our, um, of our lifetime, you know, anywhere in the world happening to be here in Vermont. Um, so I, I wanted to see, um, yeah. Um, I know we're going to go to question and answer, uh, but I just wanted to um, thank Robin. But also, um, I've been I've been probably spending summers in Vermont for over 25 years, and um, my business partner and a company that I started here some years ago called Building Fearless Futures, and we do race mitigation work here and abroad, but my comrade, Nadahe Stoddard, his parents um, knew Robin and knew um, uh, other elders in the community, in a revolutionary community. And um, like Yane is saying, you know, I learned from them. You know, I watched them. You know, I watched Sally, I watched Sekou Dad, you know, uh, just model what it is to be a freedom fighter. And um, obviously, uh, some of you have been able to watch Robin um, model the same. And so we want to thank you for having us. But keep up the good work and please don't stop. Right. You know. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you so much. This has been um, really uh, enlightening to hear your story and both your stories. Um, and I have so many questions and I think others probably do too. Um, and, but let me just ask two of them. And one, one is, um, okay, here in Vermont, we don't have the death penalty, but we do have, do we still have solitary confinement? Do you know? Yes. Okay, for someone to be in solitary confinement for 25 years, but the way you describe it, he was out and meeting with people and doing stuff. I didn't understand. That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Yeah. 
And uh, just to say, the other question I'm interested in, which is our Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, is focus, focusing on reparations. And that is been talked about a lot. Certain cities uh, have uh, implemented a form of reparations. I'm just wondering what you all think about that. So um, for your first question, that's an excellent question. Um, when I'm speaking of my father um, and incarcerated people in general and the culture of prison, you can be in solitary confinement and still have a full situation going on, which my father always did, even though he was, and like people on death row, Mumia, other folks, they dream outside of the walls and they have relations and contacts and letter writing and email, well, emails now. Uh, but prior to that, a bunch of pen pal style writing folks. And my father would, on phone calls and stuff like that, literally pick my brain about things that are happening on the inside in order to share it back with the rest of folks incarcerated. But also... Um, in 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 prison, the solitary confinement and the general population are uh, uh, macro and microcosms of themselves. So people on the outside in general population will be talking about Mumia on death row or wherever it is. They'll be talking about Maroon in solitary confinement. They'll be sending little notes and kites and communicating and sending packs of cigarettes or whatever food or whatever to communicate with guards paying or whatever to have a lively level of communication and people say the prison grapevine is stronger than any communication that we have here people know stuff in prison before we know it and so in reference to the second questions um reparations uh, is such a broad thing right now i will say quickly and pass the mic is that i actually don't support reparations specifically for the murder of Africans, historically, there's nothing you could pay me for my ancestors. I want all of y'all to know that. It's nothing that you can pay me for what you did to my ancestors. Now we can negotiate from there. You know, it's nothing you're going to give me. It's nothing you can give me for what has happened to our people. What has happened to people in generally, historically. It's nothing you can't take. We can't go into a capitalist thing with these people, because they'll pay you off to forget about things that you're never supposed to forget about. So I'm looking at you in the camera, don't take no money to forget about anything. Don't take no buildings, no land, none of that. It's going to repair what has happened. We still need it though. We still need the money, we still need the land, we still need all the things. And we need you to know also, more than anything, is that we're not you. And we're not looking to do the things that you did. So if you actually turned everything over to us, equality will be on a certain level for sure. Because we're not looking to move into your house and take your house. There was a there was a uh, there was a uh, type of ideology going around here in Vermont that Black Lives Matter people wanted to come and take your house. You know and. I'm not a part of Black Lives Matter, I don't support whatever, whatever, but we don't want your house. We just want to be left alone and we want a flat playing field. That's all we want. And if we got better on that flat playing field than you, you wouldn't have to worry about it. You would not have to worry about it. If we got an equal shot at whatever gig, job, whatever, whatever, we're not going to get in power and try to hurt you. That's what we, I need you to know about reparations. Other than that, we need we need equitable we need we need equitable uh, 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 relations. Period. Well said. Oh, well said. Did you want to say anything about reparations? He said it all. <laughs> you know, I'm saying you know we get to the next question. Okay. You was thorough. Do we want to keep going, or do we want um, to have a Oh, um, I mean, that's uh, that's up to. I mean, if we, we if you you film it, you can always get rid of it. But if you don't film it, unless you want to go, unless you want to stop, if you don't film it, you can't what, get it back. <laughs> what are we saying? Aren't there questions here? Yes. Does anybody yeah. anybody have any I questions? Think, I think she was asking a very legitimate question in no. the context of uh, interpersonal 
and what may transfer in the dialogue of the questions that may be. I think it'd be a better space if it was discussed here. So that people. It's unusual to have people in person to get to meet like this, and I think that it should be a space. more intimate. And, do you, yeah. and right. do you think that the camera changes that dynamic? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh. I don't know if that's enough. How do people feel about it? I mean, his statement was a beautiful yeah. credenza. Right, <laughs> it doesn't so didn't have anything to it. So I could I'm, see. I'm open to whatever folks want to say. Is it? Wants to be. I think it, it'd be good to have more of People a may want to say something. I think it'd be good to have more of a dialogue than questions. Yeah, we, <laughs> yes, and, and so, um, you know, actually, um, if there isn't anybody who has a question at the moment, I, I do have a thought about reparations that I would like to share. Um, just to me, I, th I think there's like the conversation about reparations, which is like often from this, the system, like repair coming from the system. Um, and, um, and I really, um, I don't think about that as Russell said, like, what can you give us? Um, but everything, and then that's still not enough, but like, you know, are they going to give us everything or, you know, do we have to take it? Because if they're not giving us everything, then we just need to keep focusing on taking you know, all of what is so that we have the, we can build the world we want. But what we can do in, in, a, in an idea of repair is like focusing on ourselves and each other and operating um, in ways that enable us to use what we have in a reparative way. Um, and, you know, and so like we talk about a lot of different privileges that people have and those privileges and what those things give us, what kinds of things we obtain through privileges. And then we can transfer those privileges to people who can do more with them in order to move us towards the liberation that we want and thinking about how we can embody, you know, and that's actually what the, um, the project that we're working on with Mike Africa Jr. Um, to raise funds for the house that was dropped. They dropped that bomb on um, move in 1985. And um, after much that transpired, um, including obviously having to rebuild the house and they took the house and they've, Mike Africa Jr. has repurchased the house and has been charged, has had to pay over uh, close to $410,000 for a house that had been paid for already that the city dropped a bomb on and then you know took from them um and um and that's an act of reparations like us actually have engaging in an act of like restoration within by you know us making sure that that the burden of that injustice is does not have that additional financial weight on top of everything it's a an, a tangible way that we can be engaging in that and and we can be thinking about how we do what we need to do inside ourselves not looking outside at some outside government force but amongst each other to build a new world through restorative practices and reparative practices that include shifting and moving of privileges and resources amongst our community and particularly to those who are in the position because of that historic knowledge that historic position in relation to the the oppressor you know and the people who are in those most vulnerable most um, you know uh, fought upon positions to be able to use the wisdom that comes from that to transform the system for everyone and that is also the point that I hear from Russell is the for everyone part um, but are there any other questions sure I will do that and I did see another question over there yeah yeah I'd love to hear your question
hopefully when like Palestine is aided and afforded what they should be, keeping that movement going on beyond just Palestine. Excellent, excellent question. I think that's an excellent question. I'll just be quick and say, um, yeah, uh, the solidarity piece is like, for me, it's always been stretching myself. So if it's something that uh, years ago I wasn't um, uh, very familiar with the politics from the queer community and I was living in the Bay. And so I had to be vulnerable and kind of go there and and be humble and listen and learn and try to stretch myself around what the questions and issues were. Um, another thing that I recognized in um, the George Floyd rebellions was that it's easy during those times for us to, you know, kind of come together and march together and blah, blah, blah. S solidarity is when when the stuff isn't busy and happening, it's not a rally out in the street, you know? Um, a mutual aid is a piece of solidarity, you know? When people need and, 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 and you know, just every regular day, not movement, rah, rah, rah. <clears throat> All right, I'm forgetting your question. She was asking specifically about students and them yeah. working now and figuring out that it takes a lot of solidarity and any best practices you could give in reference to solidarity and how to stick it together even once this stuff is, the hoopla is moving down the road. Right. Well, let me say this, and on that's from experience. Solidarity changes from year to year. Mm -hmm. But one thing for sure, we have been able to build enough solidarity with people who are still here, still filling yards up like this, still filling schools up. This government wants you to see you as failing. As long as when you get up in the morning and understand that whatever it is that you're fighting for at that point, and uh, that you have got to do the best you can and, uh, and get out there. Things have always come together in solidarity, you know, with us and all, uh, you know, um, and with the women's, you know, um, for peace. Yeah, it comes together because we continue. You know, I have been to meetings, they call meetings, and sometimes without exaggeration, and you know, it'd be huge. We call for a demonstration in the streets and over a thousand people come. There's information in this gathering. As long as people can see people continue to working and seeing that solidarity. You know, and like my brother was saying, solidarity ain't like, you know, when you see it. You no, know, we all at a demonstration. What happens when that demonstration is over? And all uh, you know, you got to get to know each other, and you got to understand too that you know we all coming from different places, and uh, and we cannot expect everybody to be on the same level, and all uh, you know, you got to take your time. That's what happened to me. I came in, you know, in, into this movement, a housewife that threw her, you know, uh, a mother of two. The housewife part was over, and uh, because mm -hmm. um, I'm having to take care of my family, um, but. You know, something happened on that corner that I needed to tell people. This didn't happen the way they said it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and there was other people came around and said, you know, I saw that too. But the stance that move took, it wound it up with, you know, who in the hell think that somebody going, you know, um, you know, care about what's going on with them? I'm telling you, millions, you know, was it? Stevie Wonder, when they dropped the bomb on his birthday, I mean, he was speaking out about it. Other people were speaking out about it. That thing of solidarity you know, exists when people are not looking. You know, you know, um, and I think as long as we continue to move you know, with love for ourselves, that's the first thing we got to understand in solidarity. You got to love this. You, know, you got to love this. And uh, you know, and get to understand, you know, who we are. Because one thing for sure, we are messed up. Every last one of us have been indoctrinated by this government. And uh, and the problem that we have, we think that we got this shit all together. 
you know, because they <laughs> rubber stamp over here. You cool, you cool, you cool. But look, that one over there, and you know, they're standing on the corner calling people motherfuckers. And you know, you done fucked up the air, you done fucked up the water. No, 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 we don't need to hear that. And you know, but my thing is, what you need to hear, John Africa taught us, and you know, whatever works, because I can stand in front of City Hall and I will be kicking out the information about what's going on. Maybe one or two people come over, you know, and say something. And you know, but everybody know that Rizzo's a Hitler spitting motherfucker, and you saying this right in front of his place. People stop, huh? What? You know, they start coming from this way, this way, and this way. By any means necessary is what Malcolm said. Said that by any means necessary. Solidarity, you gotta use what pulls people together, and that is clearly love. And understand that, you know, in this movement, again, we all don't come from, you know, from the same, and even if we came from the same house, we're different people. Mm -hmm. We experience different things. We got to have, see, patience is, um, we got to stay good examples because examples work when words don't. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people don't love the sister here because she taught revolution. They love her because she is revolution. She reaches out to the young, the poor, the black, the white, and, uh, you know, on any level that she can fight. So you pull people in with those like minds and some people won't want to take it the other way. But as long as you keep going, mm -hmm. you know, and if they start something over as long as it's going after this government and taking this sucker down, because right. you have people like with flyers, people say, you know, well, we got to have this round. It got to be this way. My thing is at your age. Express yourself because my flyer might have something that's cool for me and my age, you know. But the young brother, you know, that's in the graffiti and you know different, you know, other kind of stuff. Cause some of them flyers, what the hell, you know. Some of the people on my level, we don't understand that stuff because it's too, you know, too techie, you, or... techie, you know, or whatever. So I'm saying, you express yourself. Let me express it myself, but we're still saying the same thing in solidarity. And right. about respecting each person's way of putting it, you know, putting it on. And, you know, one thing I mentioned is we have a project that's an example of that, um, the Curb Fest for Political Prisoners. Um, and it, it came out as a result of this old head working and doing something, you know, where he was, you know, taking this festival and adding a political prisoner um, educational component to it. And then, you know, um, there was um, a movement of solidarity between the two campaigns for Maroon, his father, and for Mumia. Um, and we built up that, you know, came together on, you know, and, and worked on that project also. And then it grew into something that's now moving across the country, the Curb Fest for Political Prisoners. And it's um, a festival that, and, and the thing is, the solidarity piece is not only the solidarity between the two campaigns, but also that you had, you know, this idea that was put together by Russell and one generation and then enjoyed by people of a younger generation um, who then came together and said, let's build this out. And then they were supported by people from both the older generation and getting the materials together and now there's this whole national project that's going on there'll be a curb fest in Philadelphia in Vermont in DC in Baltimore in New York in um, Chicago Oakland um, Texas and it's just growing and growing first one is just in Philadelphia and it's growing and growing and that's an example of you know taking the wisdom and hearing what the young people were interested in as far as like we like this but it needs to be the the, the these, these pamphlets, nobody's going to look at these brochures. We need different brochures, and you need this and you need that. And so what will appeal to the young people? And then what information is held by the older people, the, the, the experienced people, and bringing that together into a project? So that's an, a tangible example of, um, of solidarity. Um, and another way that solidarity looks up is mutual aid, like he said, bringing together the resources. So projects are, you know, like our project, um, the Care Space Project also is an act of solidarity where people who have space provide that space for people who need respite, right? And so, um, and that there's always political, ideological um, engagement in all of that. So always remembering that that piece is important of always contributing to in the growth and supporting the growth and centering growth and education, um, you know, um, and ideological growth. Um, 
So I, I know I do want to talk a little bit about BAT, but I did want to see what your question was. Um, sure. So, like, that's like, like a core part of you know. Um, I think what a lot of what we think about and work about and work on is, um, you know, we have our principles. So, like, Ubuntu Freedom has a set of principles. Our principles of freedom, um, and those principles represent a vision, like a, what we offer as a collective vision or like evidence or like a measure against which to determine, like, are we are we in alignment with our vision for what we're building, um, and then. Um, the call is to do the work to embody it in whatever different ways you can and to help us to think about the fact that it, it doesn't have to be the whole thing right now. Like we can do pieces. We can we can embody that in small ways and then build on that and grow that. And that's what all of those projects are about. So like even when I talked about the project of the Curb Fest, there's also the element of you don't apply for permits. Right. We talk to all the members of our community and, you know, and when you talk to them and you figure out, like, um, how late can we go that without upsetting so and so, you know, Miss Ruby and, you know, you know, how, you know, do we want to take the cars off the block or do we do we not want to take the cars off the block? And, you know, all of those kinds of questions that and then everybody understanding why we're doing this. We're here as a community together. This is an important issue and we're doing this together. Right. And so we're explicitly not turning to the state. You know, when we we, we also do camps here called homegrown maroons um, in Vermont, where we bring people from other communities here to Vermont in order to be able to like have a weekend where you can immerse in um, being connected with people who are um, aligned ideologically like aligned with our principles um, and like being in connection with the earth and with nature and you know and operating we all just like take care of each other for a weekend you know um, and you know and that's about another form of embodiment right and the food a lot of the food that comes gets donated because we're a community right and so we're having that kind of experience and so um, I think that as Mama Pam was saying that the modeling you have to think about ways like that's one of the things that I obsessively do is think about ways to embody the next like the reality to break out of the framework of the imagination like of the white imagination or white supremacist like framework and imagination into like the, the all kinds of dreams that can go beyond that and then like living inside of a piece with some people like some piece of like what else there can be, you know, and the ways that you do that and thinking about how you take that from an ideological place into a tangible place so that other people can see it and even step into it and experience it with you. And then they can say, oh, that actually can be real. That actually is a real thing. Um, so I think that is, you know, hopefully helpful um, as it relates to thinking about ways to um, to break off, we, we can't let, we can't expect people to stop relying on the state if we're not creating an alternative. So 
our jobs are to in our small spaces, in our small communities or our larger communities, whatever it is, to do the work of embodying what it is that we want, that, that people need in order to shift, in order to have and start to develop new beliefs. So I, I just want to say quickly to uh, some of your questions, specifically in reference to um, what we like to call the new world that we're building, you know, and it and it touches on the solidarity, you know, question also is, is that um, there's a there's a ton of actual um, hard evidence on and offline about uh, our struggles on building this new world. It's not like we're starting it today. You know, we have move, you know, uh, we have Chiapas, you know, we have. Um, uh, a, a multitude of different uh, uh, intentional communities right here in Vermont. Strengths, weaknesses, all of that, you have to take that into consideration that we can't build the new world without the kind of stumblings of Chiapas, of MOVE, of those communities here in Vermont, of Mondragon. Anybody familiar with Mondragon? Okay, so Google Mondragon when you get a chance. They are corporate. They're not the they're not the little org or intentional community that we're thinking about, but it is part of that study of the separation from the state, what it takes, you know, what best practices are. Do you need finance? Do you need tech? Do you need education? You're gonna need those three for sure. It's no getting around it. Even if your finance is internal, even if your tech is whatever it is, even if your education is Paulo Fieri, you know, whatever it is, you know, they're successful in Chiapas. They're successful. They've been successful for over 20 years. And their tech is their tech, you know, and their education is their education, you know. But I think those are excellent questions, and we should learn from all of these things and try to come together together and build those things and remember it it it's not going to be easy it shouldn't be easy you know and and some of our ancestors say any easy fights or any easy victories you don't want them don't claim them you know, I talk about the okay. Amish. Uh, oh yeah the amish I'm going yes. to propose that um, and the brutal off that uh, we give the filmmaker uh rest and um do you want to do a little rundown? oh yeah let me just talk about the black okay you want to just yeah that up um so um and, and where the intersection is. So the Black Alliance for Peace. So one of the things that we've been talking about is like the importance of like deepening our analysis and our, dialog and, and our ideological understanding. And I think that the Black Alliance for Peace is one of the, um, the best resources um, for that kind of ideological growth. When you're trying to understand what's happening um, on the ground here, you know, like we, we, a lot of people talk about the 1033 program now. Um, some of you may or may not know about the 1033 program. It's the program that enables the 1033 program is the program that enables, you know, they have the, the military and they have all these toys, these tanks and all of that. And then they're like, we want new ones. And what are they going to do with the old ones? So they figured out, how about we give them to local police? So the 1033 program is a program that enables that to happen. And like the Black Lines for Peace is the organization that really began to um, educate people about the 1033 program, whereas it's much more commonly known now, um, putting information out about um, the exchange. Many, many years ago between um, Israeli um, occupation forces and our local police um, is something that um, the Black Alliance for Peace really made sure people in um, the black community, you know, began to be able to know about and understand and help support um, other organizations like JVP and getting the word out around that. Um, and also, um, you know, really helping people understand like what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on when they're saying like that we maybe we need to try to invade um, Cuba because um, they're being racist against black people. Like, what's really going on there? What's happening in Venezuela? You know, who is the bad guy? Like, really trying to figure out what, how to navigate all of that when we have so much propaganda, right? The Black Alliance for Peace is very connected and has people who are organizing on the ground all around the world um, and, you know, is able to, because of a longstanding, you know, focus and, and analysis that they've been making on all of these different situations, knowing histories, not studying 
studying them after the fact, but knowing them and watching them for, for years and decades, you know, and those organizers coming together and bringing that information in one place. Um, so it's a really, really great place for that kind of analysis and then for organizing around those kinds of concepts and for getting to connected to people from a range of different generations. So that intergenerational solidarity and, and it's an organization that's for the memberships are people who are of African descent. Um, and then there's a solidarity committee and Jill is a part of the solidarity committee um, for people who are not so we can still do that work together. They have a U.S. out of Africa network, which is also a whole network of people. It's an arm that is doing the work to advocate for the um, to the U.S. to stop stop interfering with the politics and um, on Africa and also shut down AFRICOM campaign, um, which is, you know, a lot of people didn't even understand and realize about AFRICOM and all of the military bases that the U.S. has across Africa and military um, military um, establishments even beyond the bases that they have um, um, all across the African continent. Um, and um, and then they have the ha Haiti America's team really helping people to understand what's going on in Haiti and expanding into South America. Um, it's really um, a, a really a great place in which to connect with organizations. Um, and it's a, it's a a collaboration of not just individuals but also organizations um, and so um, we did also want to bring um, the black lines for people peace here to connect and um, and and this conversation to um, speak to like what it is that's at stake and like f to represent locally what it is that's being fought as well as like to understand those connections between ourselves here and what's happening you know um, globally um, you know in this war against you know African people and working class people um, all across the globe um, so yeah that's our you know Jill Could I say something about the best yeah yeah please well she, 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 she doesn't want the camera so um, as, um, as Yane was saying um, BAP is, has the Black Alliance for Peace for Africans and the Black Alliance for Peace Solidarity Network is for non-Africans and I came to BAP actually from a place of an environmental activist and also from a Nicaraguan family as a Nicaragua solidarity activist. And I have to say, listening to Mama Pam, I had those moments that you're describing, like when they're saying that it's like this and you're saying it's not like that, yeah. when they are having a coup attempt in Nicaragua and my family and friends and me going to Nicaragua, it's like what we read here is like it's, it's it's night and day right. in terms of what's happening. And BAP had that analysis all along to understand that it was a coup attempt. And, you know, a lot of the left is divided in the U.S. As, um, over different issues like the issue of Nicaragua. But BAP's leadership has been so impressive to me. And, um, and one thing that BAP strongly emphasizes that you're getting a little taste of here today is political education. And that's what I really think. I think we're at a very exciting moment in world history, but in U.S. movement history right now. And as Ajamu Baraka, one of the founders of Black Alliance for Peace, um, has said, this is a moment when the contradictions are coming to the fore. And with um, the U.S.'s role in the genocide in, in Gaza, it's making all these contradictions so apparent. And so the repression of the state has been stepped up. Mm -hmm. And it's really mm -hmm. important for us to grow as a movement, to build unity. And I feel that that's <coughs> providing that leadership. And there is um, actually um, at the meeting of the, so uh, Danny here is also in the BAP Solidarity Network. And at the meeting on Tuesday, they announced like a, um, a series of educational, like a, like a course that you can take, which is really important. Yeah, I guess they said that there was like a working group. That okay, so uh, let's turn on. off the computer, the have camera, because we're not hearing voices, and your talk was wonderful. I don't know why you didn't want take to the mic. Oh, I thought you didn't mind me recording. It's okay. No. I just so we it. might as well just so turn she it off. She recorded the sound. I recorded the sound. But, the but can running. anyone hear? Well, oh, yeah. well, anyway. It's not uncommon to <coughs> not turn the if somebody doesn't want the camera focused, okay. it's not uncommon to do but that. But you have the sound. I got the sound. We can talk about it. Poor sound. Yeah. 
No, well, she great. can hear it. No, She's got other oh, mics. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and I just, I know. It's good. just <laughs> one, <laughs> one last thing that you I wanted to add <laughs> is that um, historical memory is so important for all social movements. And this is something that we look at in, in political education. And it's something that's, you know, it's important to the people of Nicaragua to remember the times the U.S. invaded them and that they did this and that to them. It's important for African Americans to remember when the you know move got bombed, to remember when the Black Panthers got repressed and pro. They keep using the same tactics over and over and over again. And that's why and we also we as a people can't forget all the stuff that they've done to us and learn from it. Thanks. Thanks. Does anybody else have anything that they wanted to ask or to share? Um Yes, mm -hmm. please. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, we've yes. got oh, got we yes. got hands yes. up yes. now. Yes. Let's okay, let's around. go, let's yeah. go, let's go. Let's All right. right. More y'all, please. Okay, so you want to go ahead? Do you want to be recorded or not? No. Do you want to I, I just the audio? Why, why don't I don't mind. mind. Okay. You can cut the off. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Speak up a little bit. Sorry. Okay, yeah, theater voice, sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nadjini. I'm, uh, I'm a international student from Brazil. I'm an eco-socialist. I'm a vegan. And I'm the chair of the Student Worker Collective at Dartmouth, one of the first undergraduate unions in the history of the United States. And it is and a weird position for me to be sitting here and to listen to talk about solidarity because I, I feel, in this country, I feel so non-comprehended when I'm speaking about solidarity and in everything that I do in my organizing. This, like, the, the people here from, the people from Dartmouth here know a little bit about it, but this term has been terrible for me because all that I do is to be, is to cultivate solidarity and to care for my people, to care for my community, which I am also from Porto Alegre in southern Brazil, uh, a country, a city that is very, that it's being plagued by the worst of neoliberalism and also by the worst of flooding because it's a city that's currently, as of right now, flooding. Mm -hmm. And in addition to dealing with the mess that is to organize in the United States, which is so much harder than to organize in Brazil. And I've been organizing in Brazil for a while with PSOL, Partido Socialista e Liberdade. E, e Liberdade. Um, so I know how it is. I know how it is to be young in, in organizing and to be invalidated in, in, in Brazil and then to be living it here in the United States is a, takes another level because then it also involves xenophobia and, and so much other lenses. And then to be de dealing with all of this and also to be dealing with the fact that my city is flooding, that my community is physically flooding. Mm -hmm. And then solidarity Palestine and solidarity with, with everyone that's suffering right now. And the students on campus that lack everything in my in my my Brazilian community on campus also and and to be this 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 point person for solidarity has been draining me ever since I stepped on this country and I feel there are people that see it obviously but most of the people do not and I feel that I need to justify myself. Every, over and over. Why am I doing this? Why we're we taking this radical approach? Why we're we doing? Why are we escalating with gold? We, we we're we're organizing the type of action that you seen at Dartmouth on May first, and it has been exhaustive to have to explain over and over in my second language. My first language is <laughs> Portuguese. I also speak Spanish, so this is I'm also terrified of be doing this. But I also happen to be an, an actress. <laughs> and I know how to use the, the, the theater voice, right? To be here, listen, so you can listen to me. So there are so wonderful lenses. I, I have to navigate so many nuances of intersectionality to even have the courage to be here speaking to all of you. And thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's what I have to do. My, my community is flooding. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's what I have to do. And you know, I appreciate the vulnerability. Me too. Um, you know, and mm. you know, and the and the challenge too, uh, to people who are not having the experiences, 
who are in the more privileged positions to shut up and listen, to follow, to not question, to know again that the people, as Russell was saying, who are at these most vulnerable, most vulnerable positions are also the people with all the compassion and, you know, and the know-how to get us where we need to go. So just follow them. And like the people whose bodies are experiencing the brunt of the violence that the system is imposing, those are not the people to question if they say we need to be a little bit more aggressive. They're the ones whose bodies and lights are on the line. And that is a very key um, piece to solidarity that I'm hearing you speak to. And also I wanted, did you come here at Dartmouth? Did you come directly to go to Dartmouth? Uh, that's, that's another story. It's kind of a long and crazy story. Uh, but Dartmouth has a tradition of offering financial aid for Brazilian, for, for low income. Uh, Brazilian students. Yeah, so I come from a, a tradition of amazing Brazilians that were also of trying to open opportunities for. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to um, maybe be encouraged like where you are is a very particular space mm -hmm. that there is yeah. a different community yeah. with which you can become connected and you know you're in school it's a very particular experience in space and and um, and so you know I, I just feel for the struggle that you're talking about and also you know want to encourage you that there is more you know and you know and maybe being able to get connected to more people can help with that too and also knowing that when you leave Dartmouth you know, I have a very close friend who like, had like a middle finger up on her graduation cap coming, leaving from Dartmouth. Like she said, it was like, ter like you know, I, I understand you. And she like loves the organizing that she does now, mm -hmm. you know, and she was from a reservation. She grew up on a reservation. So it was a very different world for her too. Um, so. I would just quickly add that um, we're here. Um, we're here, we are in Vermont. Um, I know where Dartmouth is. Um, and I want to be supportive to you in any way that I can. Um, we'll give you our emails and numbers. And um, we also have groups, friends, folks that, you know, this is not a struggle that we do alone, you know. And so we want to be here for you in any way and shape that we can. And we want you to be invigorated and not wore down. But the wore down can be part of it in some times, in some ways. But if any way that we can help for that not to feel that way, we want to do that. That is a certain level of solidarity for me. Right. I'm gonna go on this side. And you, I saw you had Jan, then we'll kind of. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, I I just uh, I love I love that you are um, just being honest and vulnerable and telling what is really happening here. Now I experience that. Um, with young people who I work with all of the time. Like I said, we have a company called Building Flares Futures and we're in schools with young people of color who experience racism, probably in ways that microaggressions to, you know, huge, you know, um, transgressions uh, against people of color here in Vermont. And so part of our work is just mentoring um, students, you know, giving them history, um, um, creating safe spaces for them, but also um, having my comrade Nadahi talk to their parents and maybe the kid that's wearing a SWAT sticker jacket or whatever it may be. Um, but we are here also to help you um, learn more about our history, our culture, um, things like that. I'm willing to link with you also and send you all kinds of links and all kinds of information or sit with you just personally 
and and give you personal history lessons, you know, as we're doing here. Either way, whichever one you want, however you decide it, I'm here for that. That's what I really love to do. That's what I'm interested in. I'm so glad that there are people here your age. How did you hear about this and how did you? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Keep up that work. We need that. Um, and so, yes, we're, we're here for that. And, and anything that you need in that context, I'm always available. I have a daughter also here at UVM. Um, she's part of Black Student Union and is their kind of history person. And maybe um, you guys may link better, but I know I'm great, but hey, I, you know, I like to kick it with young folks so I don't look and feel great. Yeah, we just, we should say like, oh, you go ahead. No, you go. Yes. And yes. I have another daughter who goes to school here at Edmonds and was called out by a teacher for being on this property. Mm. Yelled at. Oh wow. Get off that private property. What are you doing over there? Get over here now. No wow. one would have yelled at her had she been white. Right. Right. Yeah. And that tone and wouldn't no have been. No one would have questioned her about right. where she was and what she right. was doing. Right. And that and that happened just a week ago. Oh, that happened yeah. a week ago. That happened yeah, we we get into these schools. We go into schools to to talk with. Um, Russell, can you get a lemonade for mommy? Um, you know, we go into the schools, um, and a lot of the pro a, a lot of the. Um, <laughs> the the things that we do like our core thing is building community and and our core like our our core focus are y'all like you're like you're the point of like when we built curb fest we built curb fest with you in mind and you know and 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 our young people own it you know they're building it up and they're you know, and they're learning together and growing together. Um, and we like to kick it and, you know, yeah, like you said, we're a little bit older. I don't have the gray, but um, we, we, we are here to, to rock it with our young folks, you know, um, and, you know, and we bring together cool people and we're bringing a lot of people into Vermont, a lot of very cool people like this into Vermont. And um, and so like the activities and things that we're talking about, like I said, we have two camps that are going to be happening in Vermont. Um, we have um, we're going to do a curb fest in Vermont um, and we're going to be and we bring you're also meeting people from other members of organizing communities from other parts of the country. We have people who came from Hawaii, from Oakland, from Atlanta, you know, to the camps when we did them last year. So, you know, it's a really cool opportunity to mix and connect with other people and to realize like that it's not just all like the fight is beautiful and we love like what our lives inside of the movement and it seems like maybe it's all drudgery and things but it's not like it's the way I couldn't survive if it otherwise I had to just let this world be what it is without you know I couldn't even have joy it is through the fact that I do movement work and connect and build community that I'm able to be allowed to have any joy inside of myself so like us coming together that's a hundred percent what it's all about so yeah like anybody who's out here trying to build community like we're here to do it with you and we also can like promise you that you can have some good times doing it as well like even in this world so that you don't have to like be you know only drained we have to allow ourselves the pleasures that allow us to be restored so that we can keep going you had a question very hard to find things um, because I didn't know about all the resources that we've talked about now at the time um, so I just wanted to add that like 
yeah, this is the first time that I'm like able to engage with this particular event in this way. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, mm. But yeah, my question was on another topic. <laughs> that's fine. That's uh, fine. Right. And talk, yeah, go ahead. oh, I was saying that this whole thing is intergenerational. Like Mike Africa, he was born in jail after a confrontation with Rizzo in 1978. That was August. He was born in prison in September. And um, he was raised in the movement. And, you know, now he's actually most, hand, you know, heading the movement and bringing more people in to the information. One thing that John Africa, you know, taught us, Come on. And, you know, our job is to spread information and to be an example. And, uh, um, night night. What happens when you do like night that. night night night? What perseverance is, you know, because his family, after forty something years in prison, and he was one of the main people that helped get him out. You know, it took a movement, but he had other. He had some ideas, and he went through with those ideas. And his mom and pop is out, and you know the rest of the move members are out. You know, and again, it was that solidarity because from a child up, he learned. And, uh, you know, he's been up here organizing, you know, as a child. You know, he went through the whole rapping stage and, you know, educating people. I think, uh, what was that saying that they had about, you know, um, rapping? It's, it's more like, you know, putting out information and gathering people and um like edutainment yeah you know, edutainment you know uh kind of things and you know now he done wrote this is his second book and he's done traveled all around and uh you know if you can look him up mike africa jr he's um, also got a dot com mike africa jr dot com you know? right and uh um and he'll be here <coughs> june 22nd 23rd um and maybe again in um southern Vermont on the 20, I mean, in July, but um, in Burlington on the 22nd at the Richard Kemp Center um, as part of a fundraiser. So actually, I think there are people here from Bread and Puppet. Um, hey. mm -hmm. And they also donated some items that um, if people purchase those items, the proceeds will go to the fundraiser for the house um, and and um, in the effort to, um, to actually re fully reclaim the house. Um, um, but that run and everything that's going to be happening on the 22nd and 23rd is going to be a run on um, the 23rd in Mount Pelier. And it's a 13-mile run, but you can run five, three, or two miles. I mean, five, three, or one mile if you want to join in. And it's 13 miles because there were 13 people in the house um, on the 13th, and he's doing this for 13 months in honor of all the 13 people. Um, and the first run was May 13th of this year, and the last one will be May 13th of um, next year, both of those in Philadelphia, and he's traveling all across the country. So more than 13 runs, he's doing it for 13 months. But one run each month will be a 13-mile run, and the rest are 5Ks. And um, and so he'll be there to talk a bit about his story, also from a personal place, and to raise funds um, as well as to let people know who the people were who were in the house. So, um, but you still had your question. Oh, yeah. Um, mm. My question was about something you said um, on prison culture. Because um, when you mentioned that here people are convicted unjustly, of course, and then they are absorbed into um, the different dynamics that exist in that place, mm -hmm. um, it reminded me of what happens in Brazil all the time, which is people being um, either arrested and then in prison without having access to a trial, and then, of course, they become, like, they get absorbed into the dynamics of, like, drug-related crime, um, organized crime. Yep. Um, and then, I don't know, I was, I just kept thinking about it and I wanted to know if, um, like, do you have any thoughts on how that, like, that culture of prison, which isn't told in many ways and, like, people sometimes don't even know, like, realize that it's a different space in that, um, like, how, how can we talk about this, um, in a way that leads to, that leads the conversation to, like, an abolitionist perspective? Interesting, interesting. Excellent question. Excellent question. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, 
we have to continue to do the work that we're doing. We have to keep raising awareness around um, prison issues. But I think one of the most important things that my father taught me is just like the whole is a, you know, is a small microcosm of general population. He used to also say like, general population is just a smaller of our society, what we living in right now. You know, we in prison too, right? We just in a bigger general population, you know? And so trying to change that culture is very similar to the organizing work, you know? And so it's, it's organizing just like folks organize in prison, just like in prison, there's an organizing culture. There's a, there was a culture of people stopping people from raping other people. It had to be built. You know, if people didn't build it, then the rape just goes on. And once those people got out of prison and left, then it rebooted back up because nobody's going to kill me for raping somebody. So I'm back at it, you know. And so it's that type of ideology and thought process that we have to continue it. We have to make sure it grows. You know, we have to nurture it. Those ideas and ideologies that you're talking about have to be nurtured. And that's why, um, you know, people like myself, Yane, Mama Pam, we're always investing in you. You know, like we have to invest in you. I have to say, wherever y'all at, I want to come to, I got to do, y'all need bread, y'all need information, y'all need whatever. We have to try to give it to y'all because it's not only solidarity, it's not just working together or whatever. It's the future of the thing that we, you know, you guys are the future of it. You know, and we're, I remember when people were saying to me, here's the torch, you're the, I'd be like, you know, but it it needs to happen. You have to know, you have to know, you have to know that I'm willing to do anything to give you anything to keep going. Don't stop. Whatever you do, don't stop. Don't turn. Don't be like, oh, well, I got my PhD now. Cause you know, you're on that road. (laughs) Y'all on that road. Y'all sound good now. Y'all look good now. But when they dangle the check in front of you or when they dangle the bill in front of you, how you gonna pay for that? That you just, you know, how you gonna pay? You up here now, you got the doctorate, but you still owe it 60 grand or 100 grand or 200 grand or 300 grand or whatever it is. And that's when we need to be by you even more and be like, we need y'all, especially when you get up there and you get into the glass tower. We need you to leverage there. We need you to be in there fighting in there, you know, because that's what we have, you know, is you. That's what we have is the investment is in you. So yeah, whatever you need, whatever you doing, whatever, I can't help but to be like, I'll submit to that. I'm not talking about anything crazier. No, I'm talking about things that are in line with the political ideas that you guys are exposing and talking about. And you need help, you need assistance. We need to help and assistance the same way. We know and we understand. One thing I wanna say really quickly um, about people, two things. Um, There is a very direct connection to a lot of the political work that is happening in your country. And I know about the floods and I'm sending resources, money, all of that there. Um, And I have people in um, La Via Capacina and MST. Are you familiar with those organizations? Right. Right. And, 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 And those people are very strong people. Yeah. extremely strong people right and they deal with a lot of the things you're doing and i learn from mst and lot La- and lavia capacina right S- specifically in the context of the connection between the struggles in palestine and land okay you see where i'm going with the occupations of 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 campuses here we need to be looking at La Via Capacina and MST, specifically in the context of keeping it. Keeping it. Don't give it back. If you're going to squat the campus, don't give it back. (laughs) Right? Uh, No, it's cool. It's cool. No, it's I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you tried. I'm glad you had it in your mind. That when we get it, we ain't trying to give it back. They're going to have to take it. They're going to have to lock us up. They're going to have to beat us. They're gonna, whatever they're going to have to do to get us to give it. But we're not just giving it back to you. Mm-hmm. Once we get it and we get it, we're trying to keep it. Like MST, like La Capacina, you know, La Via Capacina. Like, this is part of the struggle. Is that when you occupy something, if you're occupying something, you're not occupying it for one day, we're going to give it back to you. That's not an occupation. 
said inconvenient. Right. You're just making them itch a little bit. What was that? What, what was that? Oh, it's a gnat. Oh, I'm gnats. Uh, Y'all just gnats. Stop being a gnat. You know. Also, there's like um, a lot of writing, right? Like the pe writing and reading what people like. So people write about their experience and they write from that experience. And that's really, um, you know, it's a timeless way to um, to get that connection and like Russell's father's book um, well he's written a lot of a lot of um, essays and um, and some of them were collected in a book Maroon the Implacable um, it's really great um, book to a uh, really great analysis and um, you know and looking at the systems and ways people work. Um, King you know has a has um, a book um, Sekou Odinga Jalil Muntakim um, George Jackson's um, book Blood in My Eye is you know a really amazing book especially like to be thinking about um, like the system and the the call to um, to go all the way you know um so i think that's a, a a thing to to also when you're looking you're looking you're looking for resources so those are you know some that you can um tap into to be able to make those connections and to perpetuate that that knowledge and information you had a question yeah well first of all thank you so much um Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just let us know, and we're there. Um, I have so many questions. I don't even know where to begin. But um, y'all talked a lot about like diversion. Um, and I mean, power like is fueled by diversion. Like um, when we talked about our encampment on the first, um, it was terrorized by riot. Even Biden, like, <coughs> yeah. basically, has just sealed the border with Mexico, Don't forget um, Obama. and we're heading into this <laughs> right, election. Right, right, right. Don't forget yeah, Obama. Like, Don't forget Obama. <laughs> and, and of course, Obama. Deporter and treat chief. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess, like, we're heading to this, like, election, and it just is like, it just seems like heading towards a car crash. Um, and in general, like, how do we flip the switch? like from this diversion and really show people like at a critical level and like build a critical mass that like the Democrats aren't here to save us, that like people that look nice in power aren't here to save us, to really like transform and like build a new world. I think educate, like what we're talking about, educate people um, so they know they can see what, the, what it is and then building the alternative so they have a way you know building and modeling you know so like encampments are a great model and like you know like the first encampment set the set the tone for the second and the next you know um and you know and so there are all these models that we can think of you just it's really i mean for me it's obsession i'm obsessed with like how do we embody the the difference and um you know and also like you know embody the courage you know um there's so I think that it's it's that piece of like you doing it and doing it with others and learning from sharing you know the, the learning and doing and the doing is in the um, manifestation of like what we actually want to be seeing do you know what I mean like um, not not living from like living in the future that we want you know and operating from that place you know and then everything is dragging is dragging the world to catch up but also being the ones to decide what that future looks like you know and not letting another entity like just make us be fighting our way along a stream that we don't that takes us to a place we don't want to go we need to like you know we need to create the the reality so if people are not like again if they're attached if they don't have any other alternative you know everybody's not an organizer 
Some people are the people who come to what is built. Everyone's not a builder, I should say, maybe. And so some people are the ones that go to what is built by those who are the builders. The organizers are the builders. So those who have that vision and understanding, they have to do the building so that the rest, the people who are not like out there on the street all the time or aren't lasting and staying, and it's like after all of the, they, they came out and they rah-rah, but then they went home. So they let you know that they're there when you build it. Right, when we had all those people on the streets, they were the people who are ready for what we are building. But we have to build the alternatives. We have to create something that they can detach for. And that is the, that's the challenge. Or they are going to go back to the diversion because it's the only thing that's there. That's why it works, because what else are you gonna do? Who am I going to call if somebody's stealing my car or if somebody is like breaking into my house or, you know, or right. Who are we going to if we don't build something for our folks so that they can turn to us? They're going to keep turning to them even after they know what they are. So we have to make them know what they are and then we have to give them an alternative, the good alternative that they can turn to in the in, through our building of community. That's what we are not giving up for. That's what we're doing. We're the builders. I, I thought I saw another question. Yes. Um, so, just very curious about how what you all think about engaging with the state with like radical tactics. Like, for example, I organize with a local group here called Free Her. And we're prison abolitionists yep. focusing specifically on you know, yeah. those yep. trans non-binary people. And we do legislation and that can feel like really draining. But on the other side, it feels like a really good entry point for people that haven't done radical organizing. Like it's tangible, it's easy, but mm -hmm. I don't know if that weakens us long term. So Oh that's an excellent question. Just curious. That's an excellent question. Anybody? I mean um, Go ahead, Pam. And uh, um, you talk <laughs> about doing legislation. It's very important because everything we do is an educational piece. You know, when you're in, when we was doing legislation, every year we was at the um, the Black Congressional um, uh, Congress, yeah. <laughs> the state rep. Um, um, what is it when all the um, black state representatives or all the way the, 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 the the, black caucus, their state uh, senators uh, and things? Uh, I, know state, what the the Senate, I know what you're talking the House about. Of right. And we were there. Mm -hmm. We were there. And uh, you know, even like with the NAACP, anything that you get out of these people, and uh, you won't have to work for it. We got them, you know, we had the Black Congressional Caucus stating, you know, and it came from, you know, the idea of a sister said, you know, let's, you know, put pressure, you know, on them. They said, oh, they ain't shit. Do you know, and that's what people, you know, be saying, you know, we in the community know that to be true. And, uh, you know, they put an illusion, an illusion enough to make people say, oh, man, run to the NAACP. But us people on the ground. And, uh, you know, we done did that, been there, done that, and, uh, and issues just pushed to the side until they could make an issue that, you know, everybody, we had to make the, make Mumia the issue that they ran to. And uh, because we were always there. And we wasn't there doing anything but passing out information. They wished that I would have been on a bullhorn and said, you motherfuckers ain't shit. And I uh, didn't go down A, B, C, D, E, F, G. No, we didn't do that. And know, uh, I remember dealing with the Million Man March and the Million Women March. People that was in so-called power, especially blacks and, you know, a lot of the men, oh, no, we ain't doing that. You start from the grassroots. You educate there. They found that they wanted to do, they wanted to show, and everything was an educational piece. Because when you can get that many buses to go to Washington, and uh, you can get that many buses, people from inside the prison, talking about legislative work, and uh, because all of them wind up jumping on board. And uh, they wrote a resolution stating that um, Mumia is innocent, he didn't have a fair trial. They got a little spank in that following year, and uh, that you know, you got to get rid of those ones who, you know, went for that particular vote. But they had 
no choice because we were constantly there at every meeting. You know, when they had the media there, you know, we were there. Martin Luther King's birthday, you know, every year when it come up, I got the, the thing from 1999. You know, it doesn't change the fact today that that was 1999 when the Black Congressional Caucus said we investigated. And we found this to be true, you know, blah, 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 you know, you know, then the following year they says, um, they, um, there's a possibility that Mumia could be innocent, you know, they, you know, they start stepping and stepping over, they, these, you know, but, you know, people didn't stay right there on top of them and on kept pushing and pushing because what they did they got rid of the old regime and on and replaced it with another one and on that other one you know um was harder you know was wasn't really harder to get to and all it's just that people started going different ways and thinking that you don't need that political pressure and or you know the state representative or the congressman that's you know in washington making them laws they in your neighborhood they're mm -hmm. your your neighbors, right. they're your neighbors, and uh, you know, legislation is, you know, uh, very, very important. And uh, again, and uh, because when you go there, you're constantly educating people. There's not an office that I can, in, uh, that that know me that I can go into. I don't get waited on like this because while I'm there, oh, you said I gotta wait. They they won't be here for a couple hours. I put on my paperwork and start telling people, did you know? Blah blah. <laughs> but I'm not raising my voice. And when I go in there, you have to always give everybody in there the same paperwork. The same paperwork. <laughs> you got to be consistent. We got city council to, um, and people keep saying, you know, things that you can't do. You got to do everything. Legislation isn't for some people. And, uh, you know, going to the churches isn't for some people. And uh, you get people who care enough about what it is that you're dealing with, and you send them in. And, uh, you know, and everybody loves a winner. And, uh, you know, and you show them. And uh, pe people admire people who stand up. Not one curse word was used, not one gun was drawn and stuff, but the power of, you know, being there and giving that information. I'm saying that there is no level that people who want to do the work on that can't. They had a bicycling, it was a running bicycle, wheelchair, every mode of, you know, movement. transportation, movement, and, you know, you know, that was done for Mamiya on the West Coast. And, uh, the, you know, the, the, the actual um, people who seen it were like, well, who the hell is this and what is this and what is a movie? You, have, you know, you have to like every chance you get. You know, I go into seniors' buildings and, uh, you know, a captive audience. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they love excitement. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is, you know, the movie, you know, in your, it's, it's like being here. But you have a group of senior citizens who remember oppression one way or another or another. They will get on buses. They're the kinds that will pass out information. And uh, there is nothing, nowhere that we should not be. Right. And you know I, and organized. I would just say like the system's here. So like we ain't, like the pe the political prisoners, for the most part, I mean, Maroon liberated himself a couple of times. He's a unicorn, you know? Um, the people who we've gotten out, and we've gotten political prisoners out, we've brought them home. We brought them home through legislative work, you know? We're not going in and blowing up the wall on the side of their cell and taking them out. So that's, you know, that process, you know, and one thing that you can do and think about is that you can also be just con con continuing to educate that th where this falls in the larger strategy of liberation. You know, that this is a part of a bigger strategic vision. And you can be communicating th while you're doing that work so that you're not, you know, falling into the problem of like, 
representing this idea that that we we vote our way to freedom like if that you know what i mean you you can it, are be articulating that that you know like that can be also a, a core part of your ideology a core part of your propaganda that that's this is not the the whole thing you know but this is our part and if this is the lane this may be the lane for you and if you are we've built it if, if it is, if this is the lane that works for you, we've built that for you, you know, and also be collaborating with others. And, you know, maybe people move from the space that you're in to another space, but it all is part of a larger, you know, weaving, you know, in the process. One thing, one thing I would quickly add is, is that in liberating my father, I spent 30 years or more trying to liberate my father. And upon liberating him, one of the things that I recognize in this last few years of really I really like I spent all these years doing stuff stuff sure. but never really being vulnerable never really challenging myself never really wanting to sit face to face with a cop with a lawyer with a legislator with a with a preacher with an imam with a uh uh a newspaper person like all these people I really didn't want to deal with because I felt like y'all can't help me liberate my dad why am I talking to you because you can't do nothing you ain't gonna do nothing I know you I watched you politician I've watched you over the years you know my dad you know him personally you are doing nothing why am I coming to you serving you drinks making you five star meals blah blah I did all of that in the end because I was at my wit's end and I thought my dad was going to die in prison. I didn't want to see that. Those are the things that I believe actually helped me to bring my dad home. Is when I turned over every stone and didn't get biased about the stones. Oh, this is a cop stone. Oh, this is a preacher stone. Oh, these are the dumb fraternities and sorority stones. Oh, you know, and I'm just like, I don't deal with those people. They don't do nothing. They ain't about movement work. They ain't about nothing. Well, one of the, the judges at the end of my dad's case, she was a Delta and something else and blah, blah, blah. I went to this church for a pastor who I used to cook for. So I went to the pastor. And I said, tell your congregation, you know, we, me and Atiola, we do the raw food for y'all, for y'all Daniel diet. You know, I know about it. I ran down scripture to him. And he's looking at me like, I ain't know you, uh, yeah, cool. You know, and I went and talked to my non-biological father who raised me, who I always shunned and hid from everybody, who's a police officer. He raised me, but I never let anybody know that. I'm not gonna let nobody know that Lil Maroon was raised by a cop. I ain't gonna let nobody, I turn to him. Hey, man, I know I haven't been, I know you, my non-biological dad. My dad, he t I was been waiting for you to, I thought you would never come to me I'm ready I've been I've been waiting for the opportunity I've been a pig all my life I want to do some non pig stuff right now but I all my all my life I didn't want that I ain't want nothing to do with it I ain't want to tell nobody in public none of that and he came out ready to you know and deal with other police officer and he was a, 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 a very rare police but he was a preacher also so he went into the church and went into the, to, you know, went into the precincts and went into the churches. And I needed that right then at that moment. Go to all these pastors, go and talk to them people and tell them my dad need to get out. And I waited too long for that. So do everything. Turn over all the stones. None of the stones are not worthy. Thank you for your For liberation. Yeah, well, thank you for all these questions. Um, I have a little bit of hope. Uh, in the next, what is it, five months of uh, trying to deal with this election coming up and looking at the two guys and evaluating the two guys. And that's why I support the one woman who is running for president and her um, petition is over there. We have to get 1,000 signatures in Vermont to get her on the ballot. And this is Jill Stein, and I would really would appreciate anyone who can can help me. Like uh, mon uh, f on uh, Saturday morning, I'll be going to the uh, farmers market, and we can each have a, a clipboard and get signatures there. And uh, I, you know, some people, I don't think it's maybe amongst you all, but who say to me, how can you? How can you support someone who will take votes uh, 
uh, away from Biden. Well, I mean, to my mind, he's a warmonger, and so how can we? How can I support him? But also, you have to look at in Vermont, um, Biden is sure to win, and supporting and getting a big vote here in Vermont for Jill Stein would be really significant. It's one state where I think we could do that, and people can't put you down for taking votes away from Biden because we know he's going to win in, in, in Vermont. So let me know. Come and talk to me. And this Saturday, I need your help. Um, to that point around um, Jill, this run, um, Jill, there are a few independent candidates out here. Jill's the only one that's running on a minor party. Um, and at this particular time is like probably one of the very best times um, in the history of like the current like political duopoly that a minor party may be able to um, draw the number of votes that would make um, that minor party like actually um, established and create that kind of ballot access. So even though Jill would not win the presidency, what she can win would be able to set up a precedent and transform the reality in a way that none of the other minor party candidates or other independent um, candidates can do. And so, you know, it's it is a significant time and a significant moment to support. And Jill is actually a very um, serious, um, very studied candidate. And paying attention to her is also another way of, you know, learning. Um, and she actually works very closely with Ajimu, who was her running mate in 2016. The Ajimu is the founder of um, Ajimu Baraka is the, the the founder of the Black Alliance for Peace. Um, and so um, it is actually I, I just want to co-sign, um, you know, Robin's effort. Um, and encourage people to see this also as an act towards liberation. Um, if you are engaging in electoral politics, this is, in my opinion, the most um, most uh, effective way to to do it is through supporting Jill's candidacy and um, spreading the word about it. <laughs> You're very eloquent. Um, does anybody else have any like questions? We also will be able to, you know, mill around and you know, chit chat over watermelon and you know, and beverages and things. But yes, a couple of you, I definitely want to. I just wanted to make an announcement. If people were interested in purchasing any of the bread and puppet um, goodies that I have on the table, I have 2024, 2025 calendars, and also a pamphlet that Peter Schumann wrote about the Philadelphia bombing way back when. Mm -hmm. um, there was a whole Bread and Puppet circus that was dedicated to That's the right. Philadelphia bombing. And um, if anyone's interested in purchasing, all the proceeds will go to repurchasing the um, home, as um, we heard. So I'm happy to do cash. We also have PayPal. <laughs> um, I'm yeah happy to figure out any method of payment um, if you're interested, and also this Sunday, if anyone's interested in being a part of Britain Puppet performances at one o'clock, we have a rehearsal at three o'clock. There is a performance, and all current performances are centered around the liberation of Palestine and uh, the current genocide going on. And we always love having volunteers, anyone um, around who's looking to just be involved and play with some puppets. Um, you're more than welcome to. Is that in Glover? Yep, that's in Glover, Vermont. And don't forget, you know, Peter Schumann will be 90. Yes, it is Monday. his 90th birthday on wow. Yes, yes, wow. yes. 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 Old wow. head. <laughs> right, and wow. uh, Bread and Puppet is such a political organization, and it is fun. You know, it's young folks. It's, I mean, it's people of all ages learning from, you know, one another. I haven't been up here for maybe 20 years and all but um they also did an event in the bowl and all for um uh you know for my family and all and we um participated in you know pup i'm saying it's a great experience for anyone who want to donate some good time learn and i mean it just they just become a um a community i was we were just there sunday and some of the people who came there for a training, was it? Or what was, um, because people were leaving. 
the apprenticeship? What was it on Sunday? Uh, you, right, Sunday right, right. But I mean, everybody was just so, it's the way I saw it 20 years ago. And um, wait a minute, it's more than that because my two girls didn't have children then. Yeah, you're just saying right. 20, like I say 20, it's closer to 30. Yeah, 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 they had children. Had. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were little people, you know, um, going up there. Um, such beautiful memories and to come back all this, you know, all these years later and being here was like being here 30 years ago and, uh, you know, um, speaking and, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's such a feeling of people who want to learn more, people who, you know, um, is hearing, it's always good to hear, and of uh, that seed that is planted, and, uh, and watch it all these years later, because it's generations. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and here I sit back here, and sister's still here, you know, uh, by doing the same thing. And uh, so, um, it's just, it's, it's been good being here, it was good being at the um, Britain Puppets Program. And uh, you talking about solidarity and how it works and, you know, people who feel like giving up. We're here because they didn't give up. They didn't give up. The only way you lose is that you give yeah, up. That's right. You have you no idea of what's behind that door. And they done kick doors <coughs> open, kick doors open, kick doors open, just bringing people in, bringing people in, bringing people in. And I'm saying again, it really feels good to look out here and feel the same way I felt 30, 35 years ago. <laughs> you know, I'm 77 now, yeah, yeah. I'm 78 this year. Numbers. So, yeah. um, and you know, like I said, I was a young woman and all uh, with- um, Small children. Small children. And all, uh, you know, that had children. And all, uh, and from that, you know, one of some of the children I was bringing up there, I'm a great, great, great grandmother from. You know, um, it just feels good being of this age, don't it? And looking yeah. around and see the <laughs> of labor. I know what it is for me. <laughs> um, Thank you. You had a question? It's Ubuntu. You're asking about this word about, Ubuntu. Yeah, the, yeah, yes, yeah. Ubuntu um, comes from a, a, a South African dialect, and uh, the meaning of the word um, is basically "I am because you are," and it's a it's it's the concept of a kind of oneness, you know, community oneness, and uh, it's a. A word and a um, embodiment that is now national. Um, there's actually software program named after this concept called Ubuntu. Um, but Ubuntu is a very strong principle um, of unity. You know, I see myself in you. It speaks to our humanity. It suggests that our humanity is our connection. That it is our connection that makes us human. We're intricately tied whether we want to be or not. You're asking about the significance of the of, Maroons. Of, of, of the, of the, of the Maroons. Yes, excellent question. Excellent, excellent questions. So uh, Maroons are runaway slaves. Maroons are people who liberate themselves. Uh, maroons are um, people who dove off of ships. You know, maroons are pirates who took ships. Um, a maroon is anyone in any situation, land, sea, air, wherever, um, who liberates themselves. You know, that's a maroon or a semaroon or there are a lot of uh, maroon terms um, um, from the 16 and 1700s that um, basically uh, uh, point to uh, 
slaves or runaway slaves or dissidents or people who are not abiding by what the state said they're supposed to be doing. So if you don't do what the state say you're supposed to be doing, in these times you could be called a maroon. And that's not just black people. Yeah. One thing I learned from Russell actually is um, is that another key um, aspect of Maroons is that they're not, in addition to not being willing to be enslaved, they're not um, accepting of the enslavement of others. And so there's also the will to liberate others. And so you have many who would be in maroon communities, maybe would escape and escape off up into the mountains or sw escape off into a swamp, but they would also constantly go back to where people were being enslaved to liberate more people and then to take them into the liberated spaces that they created. And, and, and for lack of better terms, we have to constantly be doing that. That's similar to the work that you're doing. You're maroon. And you're going back in there with all of them, and you're trying to be like, come on, get over here. I, we can, I'm Harriet. I'll take you, you know. <laughs> and they're like, but I might get, don't worry about it, you know. I might lose my job. I might get shot. I ain't gonna, I'm where I'm gonna live. You got somewhere for me to eat at. But, you know, those are real life things that liberators, you know, have to do in order to get people off the plantation. You're not gonna get them off the plantation with, no food, nowhere to live, no <laughs> safety, no, you know, and these are the things we have to start providing for our communities. Come you know, die and starve with me. Right, yeah, come down and, and be poor with me, come down in the worst case situation with me, come down with no uh, fun, no joy, you know, no. And so this is another thing movement wise is that we have to, it has to be, it gotta be cool. It gotta be sexy, yeah. <laughs> you know, it gotta be fun. Yes, it's going to be all other things, too. It's going to be rough. We're going to be crawling through the mud. And all, but once we crawl through the mud, can we have some fun? Can it be cool? Can I look cool? Can I look sexy? You know, can I be that in a certain type of way? With us, not with that, you know, but with us. Can we have a, 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 a loving space that receives us in and cleans us off, heals us up after we've crawled through the mud? because that's what we're doing. Dealing with Palestine is crawling through the mud. And after that, you want somebody to wipe you off, shower you off real good, give you a little massage, whisper in your ear, it's gonna be cool. It's gonna be all right. We gotta keep on my, I got you. Back out there, buddy. <laughs> but without that, it's just the constant, no. We can't, we'll never make it that way without loving each other, without patting each other on the back, without whispering in each other's ear, without holding each other, without holding space that is loving. We need love. We're gonna need love in this situation because the opposite is we know what the opposite is. What we see them doing in Palestine, we have to do the opposite. We're not doing the opposite good enough. You see all the hate and all that they got over there? Do you see our equivalent over here? No, we have to up it. Up the love. For us, for us. When we see each other, when we interact like this or whatever, we have to bring it. We have to bring the love for each other. We have to go out and beyond for each other. We have to create a little more space for when you acting up, when you turn up, when you going through your ups and downs. We have to create a little more space. We gotta be a little more compassionate. Cause you acting up for whatever reason. Something might have happened, you lost a job, your parents died, whatever it is. You had problems in childhood. We all did, and we all have to create space for our community for that. We don't have medical, and we definitely don't have mental health. We have to build those things yesterday, because we can't keep calling the cops on mental people. People having mental breakdowns in your family, you call the cops. Oh my God. No, you didn't call the cops, because they don't come for mental. They come for, you know, they come for it. They're gonna just muscle you up and do all their tactics that they do they, they, in defense of them. They're not social workers, they ain't mental people. You calling the wrong people for the job. They come in and do their military. You call military for mental, that's what you're gonna get. You know, and so we have to, we have to work harder to build our own little institutions. We have to start unionizing even if it's 
our funds collectively. Put a penny in a pot. Let's start a penny pot. We can find them on the ground. If we dump them in enough, they will accumulate to something. Then we can take those pennies and invest them. Do whatever. Leverage those pennies. We're not doing that. We all, I, I'm not going to tell you what my indulgence per week is on <laughs> the things that I indulge in, but I'm willing to cut it and put in that pocket, put in that pot with all of you. You cut something. Just have one less sandwich a week. That's $12. <laughs> 28. These, they got $28 for a sandwich. One less sandwich, we got 20, we got close to 30 bucks. 30, 30, 30, 30. And we could do something, we could do something. It don't have to kill you. One less joint, one less beer, one less sandwich a week. Y'all all got too many joints, too many beers, and too many sandwiches. He did end up telling you what his things are. <laughs> but you know, one thing to the point of what he said that it reminds me of that goes to with what you were talking about earlier, that I have a saying that I say um, when we talk about we need to have the compassion and the people because we get so disappointed in like our comrades, right? Like the people who exactly. are supposed to know, exactly. the people who are supposed to be here for us. And exactly. it is like, oh, but you, you, you broke my heart. You're the one that's supposed to understand, right? Um, and my saying is for the people in spite of the people. Mm. Um, and I just like remind myself, you know, because to the point that Russell's making, like we all are like in this space that smashes us all day with hammers all the time. We're like having the mallet over our head constantly. We all are fractured. They're fracturing us all and we have to have compassion and that compassion helps us to not all the way go broken. But even if we do go all the way broken, we have to have compassion because that compassion helps us to begin to heal. So, you know, but we're all fucking up. <laughs> I am sure, like, I can't, I, I just ain't gonna believe none of you if you say I'm the one that's not fucking up. <laughs> you know, we're all doing it, you know, so it's whomever, and we can't necessarily find the compassion for every single person, but as many, off, as many people as we can and as often as we can, we do that. We take care of ourselves with our limits and our boundaries, but then the ones that we can't offer it to, we support those who can. Don't say, oh, how you gonna have space for that, 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 that over there? Maybe you want to protect yourself from this person over here, but if you are able to protect yourself and have space for this person so that they can be held and we can still get the work done, you know, I don't really care. I don't have to like, I want the, I want to win more than I want to like the people I win with, yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, that's, we have to get through all of the the things and keep our eyes on the prize as we look, think about history, keep our eyes on the prize. I got one last bread and puppet thing. Um, <laughs> Come on with it. As we've been talking about young people and how we can like connect and communicate and be in solidarity, although I hate it so much. I run the bread and puppet press Instagram mm -hmm. and <laughs> we have accumulated a huge platform. And as I'm hearing other people from around Vermont talking about the work that you all are doing as young people, um, we have a platform and we want to be connecting and voicing opportunities, things like the event today. So please always reach out with any information you have even if we're only getting a couple more people like we want to be spreading the word of like what is going on in vermont because as big of a reach as we have our biggest concern is what's happening in our backyard and in vermont and how we can um use that platform to just support you all so please reach out on instagram um we want to amplify your voices as much as possible and as gross as Instagram is, that's where a lot of the young people are, and we want to, yeah, connect with you all. So am I hearing you correctly in saying that folks here could come to you, we could come to you Absolutely. and have Bread and Roses as a platform that we could put positive Bring information, public. movement information out on. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Thank you. And what and what what are your numbers follow wise or whatever? We have, we just hit 32,000 followers. So we have, you know, not everyone is Vermonters. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so that's the bread and puppet press. So we are making like the cheap art manifesto and all of the right. kind of art you see. And then there's also the bread and puppet theater. 
and I think they have 43,000 followers, and we often are, you know, collaborating and connected on social media. But so you don't run both of them, you just run, run one. I just run the press. But no problem. I have, I have connections. No problem. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> That's good enough. Yes, so, it is enough. Yeah, we have two huge platforms. And awesome. We're here for Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, any Thank last you. little, any last kind of anybody, comments? Anybody. Or, you know. Someone who didn't say something. Someone who didn't. Please. Care. No, please. Please come I again. I'd like to connect with all the young people for sure after an exchange. Where yeah, you, let's where get some from? connections. Where are you from? Well, I'm from here. Do you go to UVM? No, I go to school in New Orleans. Okay, okay. Mm. She's okay. like, I'm a young person. I'm going to connect with other young Okay. And you're just on break. Are you in school now in New Orleans? Yeah, okay, okay. Because we also have some comrades in New Orleans and in Mississippi that we possibly could link you with if you're interested. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 Awesome. What's anybody, up? anybody else, please, anybody, jump in last minute, please. We would love to okay, get you. Thank you, you brother. Like, like you mean like when you say like the knowledge the like the the people like that are aligned with the like the white supremacist nihilistic state or are people who are leaning on that direction is that what you mean when you ask that or well, well it depends on your definition but i think i'm basically saying like people who buy into the idea of like impunity or like foreign policy isn't just people who don't have like a, a solid analysis and in and in, in, in the range of realities that that might you know look like that are still in your life that you know haven't come to understand what you know or you know, that kind of yeah, situation I mean, I would say like feel that America is a pretty evil empire but just that it's not possible to change mm. you know one thing that I really like to reference, so, you know, as Russell was saying, so one of the things that we do is we go into some of the schools and, um, you know, and and um, and our, our, our comrade Dahe, um, who's um, grew up in Vermont, he calls himself, he said, no, he's a red, he calls himself a redneck that no one else can out redneck, you know, um, you know, but, um, you know, with very solid um, politics and um, very clear positions. Um, who spends a lot of time working explicitly with like the actual like right wing Nazi ish kind of kids kids who are like bullying and you know but also with adults you know in that arranged you know parents administrators and just neighbors um, and he puts a lot of time and energy into um, engaging in order to um, tr transform you know what they know and understand and they take what they know and like contextualize it better you know inform them better you know and all of those things one of the things one of the resources that I really like um, was actually an essay written by Russell's dad what is the is the 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 f f the real fighting oh, oh black fighting formation strengths and weaknesses no no the real, oh, oh, real the real resistance to North America? Yeah, yeah. the real resistance to slavery, slavery is that in North America. North America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons that I like it so much is because it gives you a, diff a better understanding historically of our relationship to each other in relationship to the state. So, you know, like Russell described, Maroons are not only people of African descent, right? So you had white Maroon communities. So you have them and how they were related to, how they related to the state, how they related to the black Maroon communities and other indigenous Maroon communities. Um, and it's a, to me, it's a really great way to um, have people realize like a shift in their 
um, understanding of like the relationships because so much is about relationships, it's about our relationships with each other, relationships with the state, relationships with the earth and with nature, right? And so having them have shifts because when you have a shift in your understanding relationship, you have a shift in how you relate to people, what you do, how you engage with people. Um, and, and ironically, or not ironically, but interestingly, a parallel that connects to Jill and the work that Jill does and how we became connected um, in, you know, Nicaragua. And I was traveling in Nicaragua and there's a history of when um, they, um, and you can correct any historical inaccuracies around this, but like when the Contras were um, in Nicaragua and murdering people and kidnapping all these people, these, taking these babies and adopting these babies into their communities. And then these babies grow up and they're um, being raised by the people who killed their parents, right? And they, the whole time, like there was a moment when there had to be a reckoning, when they realized that these old ladies who were out there holding out signs and demanding, where are our children, that these kids who are being raised hate these old ladies right and these are their actual grandchildren Grandma. you're the children that they're right and being able to see who you really are in comparison to who you've been told you are and then the shifts in relationship that come from that and it's the same thing that i feel that that essay does and having people to understand that you're <laughs> the great, 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 great descendants, grand descendants of the best friends, you know, like the, the, the great, 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 great descendants of the best friend, you know what I'm saying? Like your great, great grandparents and my great, great, great grandparents were, were in solidarity. They were best friends. Our communities were connected and you've been taught this opposite, but we're actually the connection, right? And being able to see that um, and like information like that, that's one, but that's one of the things that comes to my mind around that is like not really trying to bombard them with the, but helping people see themselves and then using that to draw them in and give them more information. You were fooled here and let me show you how else you were filled and let me fooled and let me show you what else you didn't know and just exposing them to information from a place of love and from welcome and like we've all are missing information and need to gain that information in order to be able to grow and reposition ourselves. Right. One one of the things that my father um, was a big proponent in and a big supporter of is 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 uh, white left revolutionary movements and the history behind them. So when Dahe says he can out redneck at, you know any white man in Vermont. He's not just talking chopping wood and, you know, maple syruping and fort. No, he's talking about actual knowing his white history, knowing the white comrades to associate with, knowing the running rebels, knowing the hillbillies, knowing the Appalachian white folks who, you know, knowing all of. So, you know, I, I love to see him get into debates with other white folks who don't know about white folks. <laughs> Just like black folks don't know about black folks, white folks don't know shit about white folks. If they did, half of them wouldn't be in aligning with the state. Most white folks align with the state because the state has given them the white identity. Okay? There's no white identity. There's Irish, there's Italian, there's, you know, there's all kinds of different European countries. When you come here as an Irish, you were white trash and we didn't give you shit until you assimilated to us. Then we'll let you be a cop. Right. We'll let you beat up on the Italians coming in or whoever until they capitulate. And if they don't say they white, you just keep clobbering them and you treat them like you treat them like they niggas. And tell them it's their fault. Tell them, that, it's, tell them it's the niggas' fault. Right, right, and, and right. And pit them against each other and all of that continue. But Dahe comes in straight, you know, under that and says, yeah, you know, my freedom fighters are John Brown and the running rebels and the, yeah, and the hillbillies and, the, and run them all down. And if you don't know them, you need to know them. These are the real white people. They tell me about all these white people and, and, and Jackson and this one on a $20 bill. To me, to, to me white freedom fighters here go white freedom fighters right here here go a whole gang of them how come you don't know them how come you ain't emulating them how come you're not going back into your community teaching your community about the real white folks that's actually worth something that's worth you talking about 
All you talk about is the white folks that ain't worth talking about. There's plenty of them that's worth talking about. Yeah, when they say they, they, the whole anti-CRT thing and it's like, oh, you, we don't want you to make people feel bad for being white, is actually you don't want them to make them feel like, tr like know the truth about themselves. You know, you don't want them to learn about the comrades and the solidarity because then you can't control them. So it's really, it's not a, they, they claim they're protecting whites, but they're actually protecting themselves from white kids from empowered and, 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 and knowledgeable white children. And, and white children now, these days, aren't buying it. Right. <laughs> they just not, they just not, they not drinking the Kool-Aid. It's a new generation. And even in Vermont, you see it here. You know, hey, yeah, I raised my kids and it's great and they went to college and I want them to come and take the dairy farm. And they like, yeah, nah, we not doing it. <laughs> and you can keep it. And well, you got a hair, just fuck the hair. Like, I don't want it. If it's tied to cows and milk and all that shit, yeah, I'm good. I'm going over here. That's what's happening here in Vermont. Not just in Vermont, but across the country. Little white kids are saying, we don't want the shit. We don't want the shit that you, you built it all up and you da-da. We don't want it, though. Mm -hmm. And now white parents are looking around like, oh, shit, what are we going to do? Oh, God, they don't want the inheritance. Oh, well, figure it out, but they don't want it. And I'm supporting. Them. And I'm even them. even more, another level is like white kids are also saying like I want to undo this fuck shit that you were doing. Like there was a kid in Philadelphia whose family was part of this like country club, and he went to school with the school. He went to school with some young people that I you know. Hear this all the way out to then. And um, <laughs> so, <laughs> the kicker. so he's going to, he, he realizes that the country club is on indigenous land, and so he wants to advocate in order to fight them to get them to give them the land back and so his family has him committed so the, same design, mm -hmm. the idea like, that he wants justice he wants that level of justice means he must be crazy and even if we don't think he's crazy we're still going to do whatever because you know what's more important your you and your life is not more important than what you know what we're upholding right? but this is not uncommon for That's wealthy what happened to Sue folk, Africa. right people mm -hmm. with with mm -hmm. family and money if you go too far left, we'll just have you committed. Mm -hmm. That's it, it's not. Yeah. Just look through, look through the blue blood history. Look through that and see how many people committed. That's all you gotta do. And what is the name of that? Il that they have a mental illness that is, is it dreptophobia? Uh, it may be dreptophobia, which is um, considered a mental illness that if enslaved people who oh, right. want to be free. free. If you want to be free. If you, if you don't want, if you try to run problem. away, it's like runaway slave disease, right? If you don't want to be enslaved, then you are mentally ill. Like, this system is that, like, sh certain about itself, is that comfortable with itself, you know? So, yeah, that, it's amazing stuff out there. But hey, so, unless somebody, did somebody else have to, because we can, we can mill around the food and, you know, and chat with each other. I would like to talk to some of you out of this circle, if yeah. possible. And yeah. We'll, we'll stay longer and wrap up, but, if, if there are no more questions, I would like to talk to people individually. Yeah, please. Yeah, let me just point out, um, there you can get fresh water in there, the bathroom is in the green door there, and food, and yeah, it was so wonderful, all of you turned <laughs> Thank up and you. safe. <laughs> Thank, mm. you. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Thanks so much to Robin and Jill, who really, really made this happen. Really appreciate it.